Now a hearing on the Justice Department's campaign fundraising investigation. The House Government Reform Committee today heard from officials in the Justice Department and FBI. The hearing's chaired by Indiana Congressman Dan Burton. It's three hours and 50 minutes. Good morning. A quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written open st opening statements be included in the record and without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that uh, two binders of exhibits which have been shared with the minority before the hearing be included in the record and without objection, so ordered. I also ask uh, con unanimous consent that questioning in this matter proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14 in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to members of the committee as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes equally decided, uh, divided between the majority and the minority, and without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the chairman and ranking minority member allocate time to committee counsel as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes, divided equally between the majority and minority, and without objection, Mr. Chair. so ordered. Yes, sir. Mr. Lantos? You are going so fast that some of us need to okay, well, take I'll slow time down. to catch up with you. Okay. I want to raise a question with respect to the release of documents. Okay. Um, as you know, the Department of Justice in writing has expressed objections to the release of documents, and uh, I will um, introduce the letter in the record indicating the reasons for objections. In essence, the department believes that disclosing internal deliberations to the public will have a chilling effect on future deliberations within the department. And secondly, the department believes that releasing the documents will infringe the privacy interests of innocent individuals who have been involved in the investigation. Um, is, is it my understanding that you intend to ignore the objections of the Department of Justice? Uh, Mr. Lantos, we don't intend to ignore the request of the Department of Justice. We worked out uh, an agreement with them uh, prior to getting those documents, which took us about two and a half years to get. And we said that before we would release uh, any documents, we would inform them of our intent we would also have a committee vote on it, and they would be completely reviewed by our staffs. We have reviewed them uh, very thoroughly. Uh, we're gonna go into some of those today, and uh, we won't be releasing them uh, without uh, the consent of the committee. So we, we, we were complying with every bit of the agreement that we made with the Justice Department. Well, do I understand that your position is that the Department of Justice has no objections to the release of documents? No, I'm sure they do object because there's some very embarrassing things in there that I don't think they want in the public domain. Uh, under the circumstances, um, I would like to amend your request and I suggest we release all relevant documents, not just selected documents and I have a definition of what I mean by all documents. Would you state your definition? Mm -hmm. The documents uh, I propose we release are all memoranda, supporting documents, and other materials produced to the committee by the Department of Justice in response to the committee's subpoena of May 3, 2000, relating to independent council deliberations. This includes any independent council deliberations relating to the investigations of the president, the vice president, Harold Dickies, Alexis Herman, Bruce Babbitt, Louis Free, and others. Uh, I've talked to our council about this prior to the meeting, and uh, uh, I don't think we have any objection to that, Mr. Lantos. 
Thank you. So without objection, that will be so ordered and those documents will be released along with the uh, documents that uh, we have in question. For two and a half years, we have been conducting oversight over the Justice Department. We watched them conduct their campaign fundraising investigation. We watched how they've implemented the independent counsel statute. What we've learned has been frustrating and disillusioning. For a long time, it looked like the problem started late in 1997. FBI Director Louis Free tried to get Attorney General Reno to appoint an independent counsel. He wrote her a 27-page memo. She refused. Then in July of 1998, the chief prosecutor on the task force, Chuck LaBella, tried to do the same thing. He wrote Mrs. Reno, Ms. Reno a 94-page memo. He was joined by the top FBI agent on the task force, Mr. James DeSarno. Again, she refused. But now we've learned that the problems did not start in the fall of 1997. It appears that they started a year earlier, in 1996 right at the outset of the investigation. The documents we have appear to show that the early problems revolved around one of our witnesses today, Mr. Lee Radick. Mr. Radick is the head of the Justice Department's Public Integrity Section. They prosecute public officials. They implement the Independent Counsel Statute. In December of 1996, Mr. Radick had a meeting with two FBI officials. Bill Esposito, and Neil Gallagher. We just received a copy of a memo from Director Free. According to this memo, Mr. Radick stated that he was under a lot of pressure in this fundraising investigation because the Attorney General's job might hang in the balance. That's a pretty serious statement. Mr. Free took it seriously enough when he heard about it. He met with the Attorney General. He told her what Mr. Radick said. He asked her to recuse herself, and he asked her to recuse Mr. Radick. Neither thing happened. Ms. Reno didn't even look into the allegations. In fact, I understand that Ms. Reno doesn't even remember her meeting with Mr. Free. And that's not unusual because we've had an epidemic of memory loss by people from the White House and the Justice Department for a long time. I understand that Mr. Radick doesn't even remember this, his meeting with Mr. Esposito. You know, I can't understand somebody not remembering a meeting like that. But then, once again, the epidemic continues. Well, what happened after that bad start was pretty predictable. One of the fiercest critics of the Independent Counsel Act, Lee Radick, was put in charge of implementing the act that he was opposing. Listen to what he had to say in the New York Times in July of 1997, when a lot of these decisions were being made. Mr. Radick said, and I quote, Institutionally, the independent counsel statute is an insult. It's a clear enunciation by the legislative branch that we cannot be trusted on certain species of cases, end quote. Well, what happened? Mr. Radick spent three years fighting tooth and nail to make sure that an independent counsel was never appointed, and it never happened. What a surprise. The Justice Department's investigation was beset by constant infighting and finger pointing. They were tied up in knots. After two and a half years of fighting, we have finally received the Free and LaBella memos. They're pretty damning. The LaBella memo speaks volumes about what was happening at public integrity. Instead of talking about it myself, I'm going to let Mr. LaBella do the talking. Here's what uh, his memo says about his struggles with the public integrity section, Mr. Radick, over investigating the White House and appointing an independent counsel. Mr. LaBella said, quote, you cannot investigate in order to determine if there is information concerning a covered person or one who falls within the discretionary provision sufficient to constitute grounds to investigate. Rather, it seems that this information must just appear, must just appear. That was on page eight of his memo. Mr. LaBella argued that there was a double standard that benefited White House personnel. He went on to say, whenever the Independent Counsel Act was arguably implicated, 
the public integrity section was called in to consider if a preliminary investigation should be commenced. A peculiar investigation, investigative phenomenon resulted. The department would not investigate covered White House personnel nor open a preliminary inquiry unless there was a critical mass of specific and credible evidence of a federal violation. And yet, the task force has commenced criminal investigations of non-covered persons based on a wisp, a wisp of information. I think that's really important. They wouldn't investigate white, covered White House personnel nor open a preliminary inquiry unless there was critical mass of specific and credible evidence of a federal violation. And yet, the task force commenced criminal investigations of non-covered persons based upon a wisp of information. This is the man they put in charge of the task force. What Mr. Labella has to say about the non-investigation of using soft money for issue ads is unbelievable. He says, quote, if these allegations involved anyone other than the president, the vice president, senior White House or DNC, and Clinton Gore 96 officials, an appropriate investigation would have commenced months ago without hesitation. However, simply because the subjects of the investigation are covered persons, a heated debate has raged within the department as to whether to investigate at all. The allegations remain unaddressed. That's on page 14. He goes on, the debates appear to have been result-oriented, result-oriented from the outset. In each case, the desired result was to keep the matter out of the reach of the Independent Counsel Act. In common cause, this was accomplished by never reaching the issue. The contortions, the contortions that the department has gone through to avoid investigating these allegations are apparent. Contortions. That's on page 14. I'll read one last quote on this subject because it's so important. Quote, one could argue that the department's treatment of the common cause allegations has been marked by gamesmanship rather than even-handed analysis of the issues. That is to say, since a decision to investigate would inevitably lead to a triggering of the Independent Counsel Act, those who are hostile to the triggering of the act had to find a theory upon which we could avoid conducting an investigation. That's on page 38. Finally, regarding the Laurel, Laurel investigation, Mr. Labella says this, quote, in Laurel, avoidance of an independent counsel act was accomplished by constructing an investigation which ignored, ignored the president of the United States, the only real target of these allegations. It is time to approach these issues head on rather than beginning with a desired result and then reasoning backwards. That's on page 14. Gamesmanship, contortions, beginning with a, desul a desired result and then reasoning backwards. That's unbelievable. Was there ever a better case for an independent counsel? Can you blame the American people or many in Congress for being cynical? Bear in mind that Mr. Labella isn't saying that he had the evidence to convict these people. He's saying that he was being held back from investigating them in the first place. So first you have the White House and the DNC closing their eyes to the crimes being committed all around them. Then you have Janet Reno's Justice Department going through contortions to avoid investigating them. That's why we've kept after this investigation as long as we have. Now the Justice Department doesn't want us to release these memos. They've withheld them from Congress for over two years. The Attorney General was held in contempt of Congress by this committee rather than turn them over. Their argument is that these documents would provide defendants with a roadmap to the investigation. Well, if this is a roadmap, it's a roadmap of a car going around in circles. They also argue that giving up these memos would chill the advice people give the Attorney General. Nothing could be further from the truth, but they are embarrassing very embarrassing, and I think that's the real reason they don't want them in the public domain. What these documents really do is expose the bankruptcy of this investigation. The damage has been done at this point. 
More than three years have gone by. Witnesses have fled the country. The fact is that 122 people have either fled the country or taken the Fifth Amendment. The only thing we can do now is to try to make sure that it never happens again. The question isn't how could we make these documents public. The question is how could we not? There are just a couple of more issues I'd like to address. First, there's the whole issue, whole series of memos in which Mr. Radick argues against appointing an independent counsel. However, when you read the people's responses to whom he wrote his reasoning, you see that Mr. Radick was either shading the truth or getting the facts wrong. Let me give you just one example. In August of 1998, Mr. Radick wrote a long memo stating that there should be no independent counsel to investigate whether the vice president made false statements about his fundraising calls. He was immediately taken to task by a line attorney and FBI agent working on the case for many blatant inaccuracies. One quote from the line attorney's memo sums it up. He says, quote, the agents disagree vehemently with the characterization of the Panetta interviews. Specifically, they assert that he did not change his statement, although the Radick memo says he did so three times, end quote. We'll be questioning Mr. Radick about all of these memos. Another important area is the department's terrible record in this investigation. The president was not questioned about any of the important foreign money players. The vice president was not questioned at all about the Shilai Temple. A search warrant for Charlie Tree's home was withdrawn at the last minute, even though the FBI wanted to go ahead and, and, and get documents. It wasn't served for three months despite indications from the FBI that documents were being destroyed. James Riotti was never indicted, despite ample evidence. I can't tell you how many times this committee's investigators interviewed someone and found out that the Justice Department had not talked to them or subpoenaed documents and found out that the Justice Department did not have them. And I met some of the prosecutors and agents who've worked on this case. They're talented people. I have nothing but high regard for Mr. Labella, and Mr. DeSarno, and Mr. Free, and for the prosecutors and agents who served under them. I think they had roadblocks put in their way from the very beginning. Let me read just one passage from a memo drafted by a senior lawyer, Mr. Steve Clark, who quit the investigation out of frustration. Mr. Clark said, quote, never did I dream that the task force's efforts to air this issue would be met with so much behind the scenes maneuvering, personal animosity, distortions of fact, and contortions of law. This is one of the guys that was investigating this." End quote. I don't know what else you can expect when one of the leaders of the investigation says at the outset that he's under a lot of pressure and the Attorney General's job hangs in the balance. Finally, if anyone still has any doubts about how political Janet Reno's Justice Department has become, what happened yesterday afternoon should erase them. My staff got a call from the Justice Department at the end of the day yesterday. Justice is not happy that we're going to release these documents. They told my staff that they had found one last document they wanted to turn over to us, and this one was about me. My staff asked them when they found this document. They wouldn't say. My staff asked if the investigation of me was closed. They said they didn't know. My staff asked who ordered this document to be turned over, and they would not answer. Well, this is about the most transparent attempt to intimidate a member of Congress that I've ever seen, and it ain't going to fly. I want answers to all these questions, and I'm going to make sure that I get them from the Justice Department. They tried to intimidate me in 1997. They started a criminal investigation of me based on some trumped-up charges raised by a former executive director of the Democrat National Committee. Well, that didn't work. They tried to intimidate me again when I sent a document subpoena to the Attorney General for information on Ron Brown. A couple of days later, an FBI agent walked into my campaign headquarters with a subpoena from the Justice Department for five years of my campaign records. That didn't work. They leaked a list of ongoing cases to Capitol Hill 
It listed my case as an open case, but likely to be closed shortly. Apparently, they thought that I would be intimidated if they kept my case open. No such luck. This isn't going to scare me or this committee off. I will not be deterred. I want everybody here from the Justice Department, everybody, to understand something. If you think that I'm going to be intimidated, you better think again. I just think it's a real shame that the Justice Department has sunk to this level. What we have here in the documents tells one side of the story. They tell it pretty convincingly. Today we'll hear the other side from Mr. Radick. Mr. Esposito, Mr. Gallagher, we appreciate very much you being here. We look forward to hearing from all of you. I now recognize Mr. Lantos for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today, this committee is holding a hearing. The majority has entitled the Justice Department's implementation of the Independent Counsel Act. A more appropriate title for this hearing would be Beating a Dead Horse. The Government Reform Committee once again reviews the Independent Counsel decision. For the record, this committee's repetitive, monotonous, and unfruitful investigation has already cost the American taxpayer over $8 million. Today, the committee is examining whether the Attorney General, Janet Reno, appropriately decided against appointing an independent counsel to investigate campaign finance allegations. According to the chairman, the Attorney General has been blocking for the president by deciding not to appoint an independent counsel. Now, our committee already has explored and re-explored and re-explored again this issue. In fact, the committee held hearings on this topic in December 1997, at which both the Attorney General and the FBI Director Louis Free testified. The committee then brought Director Free back to discuss the issue in August 1998. These dates are significant because the chairman emphasizes a memo written in 1996. The FBI director testified in December of 1997 and in August of 1998 on the same subject. And we shall hear from him in a moment. Director Free repeatedly said that he believed that the Attorney General's decision was motivated by nothing but the law and the facts. I wish to repeat that. The FBI director repeatedly testified before this committee under oath that he believed that the Attorney General's decision was motivated by nothing but the law and the facts. Now, however, Chairman Burton believes that he has a smoking gun on this matter. He claims that a December 1996 memo by Director Free, recently described in the media, requires revisiting the Independent Council decision. On May 18, press accounts reported that in this memo, Director Free commented on remarks by Mr. Lee Raddock, Chief of the Public Integrity Section of the Department of Justice, who purportedly made to FBI Deputy Director Mr. Esposito that there was a lot of pressure on him regarding the campaign finance investigation because the Attorney General's job might hang in the balance. On May 19, Chairman Burton issued a press release on this 96 memo. The press release states in part, this committee has been investigating the campaign fundraising scandal for three years. In that time, we have uncovered significant evidence that had led us to conclude 
that Attorney General Reno has been blocking for the President and this administration. Now we have a piece of evidence from the director of the FBI, now meaning a memo dated 1996, that makes it abundantly clear that we have been right all along. Janet Reno and Lee Raddock have been blatantly protecting the president, the vice president, and their party from the outset on this scandal." End quote. Director Free's own statements before this committee, however, directly contradict Mr. Burton's theory. Director Free, who disagreed with the Attorney General's decision regarding the appointment of an independent counsel for campaign finance matters, testified before our committee in December 1997 and August 1998 a year and almost a year and three quarters after this memo uh, at great length. At these hearings, he made numerous statements under oath regarding the Attorney General's decision and her integrity. I suggest we take a look at what he said. I, uh, uh, I have tremendous uh, respect for our Attorney General. I have tremendous affection for our Attorney General. Uh, I do not believe for one moment that any of her decisions, but particularly her decisions in this matter, have been motivated by uh, anything other than the uh, facts and the law which she is uh, obligated to follow. Uh, if I thought anything differently, I would not be sitting here today as the FBI Director. I think uh, in all the matters that I have dealt with her, and this is over five years, you get to know a person pretty well. She has always brought honesty and integrity to the table. We have, uh, we have additional. He's made the statement, I don't know if he made it publicly or privately, that he thinks the Attorney General is just covering up for the White House and the Democrats, and that's why she's not cooperating. Do any of you believe that? Director Free? No, I don't believe that at all. <clears throat> when the Attorney General declined to appoint an independent counsel, um, did the ongoing investigation come to a grinding halt? No, sir. Did not impede it at all. It is proceeding with full force. Yes, it is. Do you have all the necessary resources to conduct the investigation? I believe that we do. We're constantly looking at uh, uh, equipment, resources, space. Uh, if I decide, as I might in the next couple of weeks, that I need to add more assistants or more uh, uh, special agents, I'll certainly make that decision. Has the Attorney General in any way directly or indirectly impeded your ability to devote the resources you deem necessary to the investigation? No. She has given you full support? Yes, sir, she has. As this video makes crystal clear, the director of the FBI, Mr. Free, discussed the Attorney General's decision extensively and under oath with this committee long after he wrote the December 1996 memo, which of course contains nothing on the basis of his own knowledge. That memo contains second and third hand information. FBI Director Free stated under oath that he does not believe the Attorney General was covering up for the White House or for Democrats. So today we have two choices. We either believe the director of the FBI that he was telling the truth in his testimony under oath before this committee 
on two separate occasions. Or, believe, or we believe Mr. Burton's theory that the Attorney General was blocking for the President. The committee today is not only repeating its own investigation on the independent counsel decision, it is duplicating recent Senate hearings on the same matter. As a matter of fact, we had to postpone the commencement of this hearing because Senator Specter was conducting parallel hearings on the other side, and they ran over time. The Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing two weeks ago, and the one this morning on the same topic with virtually the same witnesses. It is also worth noting that today's hearing concerns the implementation of a statute that no longer exists. As a matter of fact, I was amused to note in Chairman Burton's opening remark that he quotes Mr. Raddock in 1997 uh, being critical of the independent counsel statute. Well, apparently the Republican-controlled House and Senate agreed with Mr. Raddock because last year they chose not to renew in any form the independent counsel statute. The independent counsel statute was abandoned by the Congress because on balance it was deemed by the majority to be counterproductive. So as of today, we are discussing the implementation of a statute and there are very few statutes that Congress abandons. This happens to be one of them. Without any sunshine provision, we just decided we'd better not renew it. So Mr. Raddock's judgment on this issue certainly was uh, seconded by the majority of both houses of Congress. The Independent Counsel Act which was enacted in 1978, put limits on the Attorney General's discretion regarding investigating allegations of criminal wrongdoing by the President and other high-level administration officials. Congress allowed the law to expire on June 30, 1999. So we are going to spend some more time today going around and around about whether the Attorney General appropriately used her discretion under the Independent Counsel Statute, when Congress has already provided the Attorney General with substantially more discretion concerning federal law enforcement of executive branch officials by allowing the Independent Counsel law to expire. From time to time, I was amused in all of these hearings to um, have reference by the other side to a built-in conflict of interest between an attorney general and the president or the vice president, because clearly uh, the attorney general serves under the president. Well, when the Independent Counsel statute was approved by the Congress of the United States, this was a well-known fact. As a matter of fact, were the Independent Counsel statute still in effect, next year an Attorney General will be appointed, who will be appointed either by Mr. Gore or by Mr. Bush. And clearly, the same argument could be raised as was raised all the time. Congress knew what it was doing. Congress knew that a president appoints an attorney general, and the attorney general decides whether an independent counsel is required to investigate alleged wrongdoing by high-ranking officials of the executive branch. As we review and consider the documents that the Department of Justice recently provided our committee, the key issue is whether the allegations of campaign fundraising abuses have been thoroughly investigated. The major documents we have received were written between 1996 and mid-1998. We know that since then, 
The Department of Justice has examined a wide range of campaign fundraising allegations. Since then, our committee has also examined numerous campaign finance allegations. In total, the chairman has unilaterally issued 915 subpoenas on campaign finance related matters. We also know that since then, <clears throat> the Department of Justice has brought a number of campaign finance prosecutions. Individuals central to the campaign finance allegations pleaded guilty to wrongdoing, including Johnny Chung, Charlie Tree, John Huang, have also come before the committee for detailed questioning. These sessions did not produce evidence of major allegations that the Department of Justice has ignored. In fact, none of these witnesses implicated any senior White House or Democratic Party officials in wrongdoing. This committee should keep these facts in mind as we proceed today. The chairman believes that there is a massive cover-up going on. Our job is to assess whether he has any evidence at all to back up his allegations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lantos. Uh, we'll now welcome our <clears throat> first panel to the witness table, Mr. Lee Radick, Neil Gallagher, and William Esposito. Would you please come forward? Would you stand and raise your right hand? You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yeah, I do. Mr. Redick, uh, you're recognized for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I am here today in response to your request that I testify about matters relating to the Independent Counsel Act and its application to campaign finance matters. I serve within the Department of Justice as Chief of the Public Integrity Section, a position that is and always has been a career position. Indeed, no one within the section is a political appointee or has ever held a political appointment. The work of the section is nonpartisan, in fact, as well as perception. As for me, I am and always have been a non-political career prosecutor, including my military service. I have more than 30 years of service with the federal government, and my career with the Department of Justice spans six administrations and 10 attorneys general. I joined the Justice Department in 1971 through the Attorney General's Honors Program, for five years, I served as a trial attorney in the criminal division dealing with labor racketeering and legislative matters. In 1976, I was selected to assist in the formation of the Public Integrity Section, where I served as a line prosecutor for two years. In 1978, I was selected to become Deputy Chief of the Public Integrity Section, a position I held for 14 years. In 1989, I was detailed to be part of the prosecution team that handled the Ilwin investigation into defense procurement fraud and corruption. As part of that assignment, I became a Special Assistant United States Attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia. In 1992, I was selected to be Director of the Asset Forfeiture Office, and in 1994, I returned to Public Integrity as Chief, where I have now served for six years. As Chief of the Public Integrity Section, I have supervised the investigation and prosecution of corrupt public officials from the executive, legislative, and judicial branches at every level of government, local, state, and federal. Over the years that I have had the privilege to work with the fine prosecutors that make up that section, the section has conducted successful prosecution con and convictions of federal judges, members of Congress, federal prosecutors, a wide variety of state officials, and numerous officials within the federal executive branch. Of course, responsibility for prosecutions of the highest level executive branch officials was removed from the department by the Congress when it passed the Independent Counsel Act in 1978. However, from the time that the Independent Counsel Act was first enacted until its demise in June of 1999, the Public Integrity Section was charged with the frontline responsibility for the administration of the Act's requirements. Our principal task was conducting initial inquiries and preliminary investigations pursuant to the Act, gathering the necessary facts to enable attorneys general to reach the decisions charged to them by the Act. In a letter the chairman sent to me last week, he indicated that the primary areas of interest for the, of the committee were to be uh, explored at this hearing were my role with respect to the campaign financing task force and my role with respect to the Independent Counsel Act matters relating to campaign financing. I will briefly outline the facts with regard to these areas of interest and then we'll answer any questions you might have concerning them. During the summer of 1996, allegations that both political parties may have violated campaign financing law in connection with the upcoming national elections began to circulate. 
In the fall, several members of Congress wrote to the Attorney General requesting that she seek appointment of an independent counsel to investigate these allegations. In November of 1996, a response was sent to these members informing them that while there were no grounds to seek appointment of an independent counsel at that time, the Department took these allegations seriously and intended to actively pursue them. It was also announced that it had been decided to establish a task force within the Department, a team of investigators and experienced prosecutors which would assume responsibility for the handling of all campaign financing matters arising out of the 1996 election cycle. This would ensure that possible connections among the various matters were not missed and that any emerging independent counsel issues arising out of these investigations would be promptly identified and handled pursuant to the requirements of the Act. Both, <clears throat> excuse me, both campaign financing prosecutions and administration of the Independent Counsel Act have been part of the historical responsibility of the Public Integrity Section. As a result, the task force, while a separate entity from the Public Integrity Section with its own workspace and personnel, was initially under my direct supervision. However, in the fall of 1997, the Attorney General named Charles LaBella to be its head. At first, I continued to have a substantial advisory role with respect to the work of the task force, but over time, as the work progressed and with the demise of the Independent Counsel Act, my role diminished. I have played no role in task force decisions since last year. Your letter, Mr. Chairman, also expressed an interest in my responsibilities with respect to the Independent Counsel decision involving campaign finance. As I mentioned earlier, the Public Integrity Section has been responsible for the administration of the Act throughout its history, handling each Independent Counsel matter since it was first passed in 1978. With respect to the Independent Counsel matters connected to the work of the Task Force, the Section and the Task Force work together on each matter, developing the necessary facts to permit the Attorney General to make a determination as to whether to seek an appointment of an independent counsel. On each matter, both I and the head of the task force, along with many others involved in the process, made our recommendations to the Attorney General, sometimes jointly, sometimes separately, based on our honest assessments of the facts and the applicable law. I was one of many people who gave the Attorney General recommendations. Her style has been to seek out the views of a variety of advisors, listen carefully to each of us, consider our arguments, ask her own questions, and then reach her own decisions. Sometimes she followed my advice, sometimes she did not. At the end of the day, it was the Attorney General who made the decisions, as is, was required under that statute. The reasons for her decisions on specific preliminary investigations are set forth in the detailed formal filings made with the court. It has been widely known for some time that there were internal disagreements among various officials on a number of independent counsel issues, particularly with respect to issues raised in the so-called Labella Memo. This, of course, is neither new nor should it be unexpected. Any group of lawyers grappling with complex legal and factual issues are bound to have disagreements, and the issues we faced were both complex and difficult. As you are aware, I disagreed with some of Mr. LaBella's recommendations, but I also agreed with Mr. LaBella on many occasions during the time that we worked together. We were both non-political career prosecutors. We had different interpretations of some aspects of the Independent Counsel Act, but I certainly agree with his recent statement that the internal debate within the department was never about politics and that nobody at the department was politically protecting anybody. Now I'm prepared to answer questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Reddick. Uh, Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I do not have an opening statement. I am prepared to answer questions. Thank you, sir. Mr. Esposito. I also do not have an opening statement and prepared to answer any questions you may have. Very good. We'll proceed under the rules that uh, were adopted at the beginning of the hearing. The last thing in the world that uh, I'd like to be doing today is uh, sitting here in front of three career government employees asking them questions about the internal deliberations of the Justice Department. But there were some real problems with what went on at Justice, and there is no doubt in my mind that uh, congressional oversight is absolutely essential. That's why I think it's absolutely essential that some sunshine be allowed into the closed-door process that led the Attorney General to reject an independent counsel. When the American people see what really went on, I don't think they'll be proud of what happened to justice. And I hope that all of the media reads the labella and free memos and the memos in question, because we're not going to be able to cover all of that in detail today, and I think they speak for themselves. It's no secret to anyone that I believe the way the Justice Department has handled the campaign finance investigation has been disgraceful. And one of the things that bothers me most is that it puts the career prosecutors and investigators on the task force in a very difficult position. They're good, decent, honest men and women 
Unfortunately, the Attorney General has put them in a position where their work has been questioned and every decision they've made is second-guessed. It mystifies me that the Attorney General would hold herself out as the jury to make all the tough calls that ended up giving the President, the Vice President, and her political party a free ride. When you have a Chuck LaBella complaining about the Justice Department going through contortions to avoid investigating matters, when you hear that about government prosecutors being involved in gamesmanship, when the head of the task force writes that this type of a negotiation, consultation, and posturing in the context of this investigation is unseemly, then something has gone very wrong. For some reason, known only to the Attorney General, she just didn't want to appoint an independent counsel to look into the activities of her boss and her political party. It wasn't the first time. She didn't want anyone to look into the Whitewater matter. Everyone tends to forget about how that investigation uncovered cor corruption that led to the conviction of Governor Jim Guy Tucker of Arkansas and that led to the conviction of the President's eyes and ears at the Justice Department, Webb Hubble. If Janet Reno had had her way, Webb Hubble would probably still be running a large part of the Justice Department and Jim Guy Tucker would never have been prosecuted. Similarly, if the Attorney General had won the day, no one would have had done anything about Henry Cisneros and the lies he told under oath to the FBI. And as we all know, the Attorney General did win the day on the campaign finance independent counsel issue, and there will never be, a, be full confidence that the Justice Department did the best job possible. The Attorney General guaranteed that there will always be a cloud over this matter, and that's abominable. It borders on corruption. Now I'd like the witnesses to take a look at Exhibit 1. I think we'll put that up on the screen. By now you're all pretty familiar with this document, and if you have it before you'd probably be easier to read. It's a memo from Louis Free, the director of the FBI, to Ms. Esposito, Mr. Esposito. The date is December 9, 1996, which is very significant because that was the, right at the start of the campaign finance investigation. Mr. Esposito, this memo describes a conversation you apparently had with Mr. Radick. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And where did that uh, conversation take place? In my office at FBI headquarters. And who was there? Of course, myself, I was there. My deputy at the time was Neil Gallagher. He was there. Mr. Redick, who was head of public integrity at the time, and one of his deputies named Joe Gangloff. Joe Gangloff? Write that down, will you? Joe Gangloff. Can you tell us how the meeting between you and Mr. Redick was uh, set up? I had called Mr. Redick uh, earlier and asked him if he could uh, stop by my office so we could have a uh, discussion on two particular issues. The first issue was regarding a formal referral on the matter that was uh, involving the finance uh, campaign. And the second was uh, the, to have some input into the FBI, FBI having input into the referral process when the public integrity section makes their recommendation to the Attorney General. Uh, can you tell us what happened at the meeting? Uh, yes. Mr. Reddick and Mr. Gangloff showed up uh, at my office. Mr. Gallagher and I met them. We had a conversation about the two points I just mentioned. The conversation was uh, cordial, uh, amicable. I don't recall any disagreements that we had at that time. Uh, it lasted, uh, I think, less than 30 minutes. At the end of the meeting, uh, just as I remember, I was getting up and Lee was in the process of getting up out of his chair. Uh, uh, he made the statement that there's a lot of pressure on him and uh, the Attorney General's job could hang in a balance based on the decision that he would make. Mr. Radick apparently indicated that he was feeling pressure and uh, he said that, uh, that her job could hang in the balance because of the pressure that was exerted on him and the decision she'd make. Correct. I remember specifically a job could hang in the balance. Now, I'm not, because it's been three and a half years, convinced of whether it was the word pressure or stress. Was there any doubt in your mind that Mr. Radick was linking the pressure that he felt and the fact that the Attorney General's job hung in the balance? Is there any doubt about that? No, it was said in the same sentence. Did Mr. Radick make it clear that he felt that the Attorney General's job hung in the balance as a result of the decision that the public integrity section reached? 
No, that, that was the extent of the statement. Just... Mr. Gallagher, uh, you were also at the same meeting. Yes, <clears throat> yes Mr. Chairman. If you would, please uh, tell us what you remember about Mr. Radick's comment about his feeling pressure on the campaign finance investigation. The memo that you have on the screen is accurate to the point that Lee Reddick made a statement that he was under a lot of pressure. And to put it into context, at the time there was a, there was a lot of published reports that the Attorney General had not yet been named in the new cabinet. And there was a statement to the fact that the Attorney General's job might be on the line. Was there any doubt in your mind that there was a linkage between the comment about pressure and the comment about the Attorney General's job hanging in the balance? No, sir, there wasn't. Mr. Radick, uh, before I ask you to respond, I want, you, I want to put the Justice Department investigation in perspective. At the time of your meeting with Mr. Esposito and Mr. Gallagher, who was in charge of the campaign finance task force? Um, <clears throat> at the time of that meeting, there was no task force that, I, that I'm aware of, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, that the, the concept of the task force occurred shortly after that meeting. Wasn't Laura Ingersoll in charge of the investigation I, at that time? I had assigned Laura Ingersoll to um, uh, begin to gather evidence uh, that uh, consisted mainly of uh, newspaper information and uh, various allegations that were coming that were coming out. So yes, uh, to the extent that there was uh, an organized effort in this area, Ms. Ingersoll was in charge. And she was a subordinate employee of yours in public integrity. That's correct. And how many attorneys were on the task force examining campaign finance matters at the time or were working with her at the time? I, I'm, I don't recall. Um, I'm, uh, it would be an estimate to say two to three, maybe five. Okay. I, I don't recall specifically. A recent GAO report says there were only about four attorneys investigating in January of 1997. Were all of these people your subordinates? Um, there were early detailees um, to the task force, but uh, for purposes of this case, they were my subordinates, yes. How many lawyers were there in the public integrity section at the time? Uh, I'm not sure, probably around 25 trial attorneys. Now, going back to the meeting with Mr. Esposito and Mr. Gallagher, do you have any recollection of that meeting? I have no recollection of that meeting. So you don't remember making that kind of statement about there being a lot of pressure on you and the Attorney General's job hanging in the balance? I certainly do not. Have you followed any of our hearings, Mr. Radick? Uh, I've followed some, Mr. Chairman, but not, not for some time. Have you noticed at our hearings that there seems to be a epidemic of people not recalling or having memory loss? I've noticed that you've observed that on many occasions, yes. The last time we had a meeting, we had three counsels to the president, the last three in a row, and every single one of them couldn't remember where the bathroom was. Well, I'm, you know, I can't speak for them, Mr. Chairman. All I can say is that... Uh, you don't remember. I do not remember this, me okay. this meeting in any way, and uh, Mr. Gangloff does not either, as he testified this morning in front of Senator Inspector. Mr. Gangloff is the associate of yours from the... Uh, He's my principal deputy chief. He's your assistant there at the public integrity section. Yes, my... And he doesn't remember either. No, sir. Gee, I wish I had him here so I could hear that. Do you recall whether you made any comment? Well, you don't recall the meeting at all, so you don't remember saying anything like that. That's correct. Although I'm, uh, again, quite certain that um, I would not have said something like this because it simply wouldn't have been true. I felt no pressure because of the Attorney General's job status. Why, why do you think that two men of the stature of uh, Mr. Esposito and Mr. Gallagher, why do you think they would lie about something like this? I have no explanation except uh, and the, the only explanation I can offer is they must have misinterpreted something I also that I said because I, I was not in the habit of lying to them and this would have been a lie. It was, uh, it was simply not true that I felt pressure because of her job status. I felt a lot of pressure here and I was willing to tell anybody and everybody that. And uh, the pressure I felt was uh, coming from her and from you, the Congress, and from the, uh, the media to do a good job. Yeah. And uh, it was a pressure cooker, there's no doubt about it. But uh, you, you don't uh, remember the meeting or saying that or anything like that? No, I do not. Okay. In December of 1996, it was being widely discussed that uh, Attorney General Reno might not be reappointed. Isn't that correct? I believe there was a lot of press speculation to that effect, yes, sir. And those rumors were discussed in the press? Yes. 
Do you have any belief as to whether individuals at the White House were seriously considering not reappointing Attorney General for a second term? I have no belief. No I, belief. I, that. I do not believe everything I read in the papers. I just don't know whether it was true or not. Well, on I know that the one, papers were reporting it. On that one thing, I think you and I agree. Uh, Mr. Esposito, after your meeting with Mr. Radick, did you think that his comment was significant enough to tell anyone else? Uh, after the meeting, I went down and uh, briefed the director on the results of the meeting, including the statement that was made. And you told him exactly what happened? I did. Do you know if Director Free told the Attorney General about the comment made by Mr. Radick? He told me that he had. Uh, we have exhibit number one uh, in that the director states that on December 6, 1996, he advised the Attorney General of Mr. Radick's statement. Is that accurate, Mr. Esposito? Uh, it's, it's accurate that he told me that and he put it in the memo, yes. But... Uh -huh. Did Director Free tell you after his meeting with the Attorney General that he had told her about Mr. Radick's statement? Yes. Did uh, Director Free tell you what Ms. Reno's reaction was? She said she would look into the matter. Look into it. Uh, when, when you got this memo from Director Free, did you find it to be accurate? Did it reflect the discussion that you had with Mr. Radick? Uh, yes, it did. Mr. Gallagher, do you know whether Mr. Esposito communicated the statement about pressure and the Attorney General's job hanging in the balance to anyone? I was that part to that discussion between Mr. Esposito and the Director. Do you have any knowledge of whether this statement was communicated to the Attorney General by Director Free? Not beyond the existence of this memorandum. But you did see the memo? Yes, sir. Do you have any information about what the Attorney General told Director Free she was going to do about this? No, sir, I don't. Okay. Mr. Radick, were you ever contacted by the Attorney General or anyone at uh, else at Justice Department before this year about whether you had made this statement? about feeling pressure because the Attorney General's job uh, hung in the balance? Not before the last several weeks, Mr. Chairman. When this memo came to light, the, uh, I was asked uh, whether I, I made the remarks just a couple weeks ago. Mr. Esposito, were you ever contacted by anyone at Justice who was investigating whether Mr. Radick made this statement? Yes, I was. You were contacted by somebody at Justice about whether or not, when was this? Uh, within the last month. In the last month, who contacted you? Uh, Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder. Uh -huh. And you told him exactly what happened? Yes. Did he have any reaction? No, he said he just saw the memo and wanted to get my version of it since it was, uh, since, since it was supposedly my conversation. He said he'd look into it? Or did he make any comment? He said that we're getting ready to turn uh, documents over, and this memo had just come to his attention. Mr. Gallagher, were you ever contacted by anyone at Justice who was investigating whether Mr. Radick made this comment? No, sir. Mr. Radick, the Attorney General apparently told Director Free that she would look into the matter. Uh, it doesn't sound like she did, did she? I, I'm aware of no effort she took to look into the matter. Mm -hmm. uh, you obviously deny that she ever made that statement. However, given the fact that the Deputy Director of the FBI and the other senior officials said you made the statement, don't you think there should at least be an inquiry into it? It seems to me that if the, if the connotation um, that uh, some put to this remark, and that is that I was under pressure not to do a good job, uh, is it was part of this that, yes, she would have had some duty to look into it. I'm not sure that um, Mr. Esposito and Mr. Gallagher put that connotation to it, um, and, I, but, and, I, and I don't even know whether Director Free does, but uh, if it was simply that uh, I was under pressure to do a good job, Maybe she wouldn't have been under such an obligation. It's hard for me to judge. Well, the memo is pretty, pretty, pretty direct there. I, I, I can't understand why she didn't uh, uh, go ahead and start a, an investigation of this. Uh, since Mr. Radick made this statement to you at the beginning of the campaign finance investigation, uh, Mr. Esposito, do you think he should have been recused from the investigation? Uh, that was a decision between the director and the attorney general. My own personal opinion was no. Do you agree with Director Free, who stated that Mr. Radick's statement is an example of why public integrity in the criminal division should have been taken off the campaign fundraising case? Well, that's, that's my understanding of the FBI's position, yes, sir. And you agree with that? Uh, yes. Mr. Gallagher, do you think that Mr. Radick's statement was an example of why public integrity should not have been working on this case? I'd have to 
take the same position as Mr. Esposito that it was a uh, that's a decision between the director and the attorney general. In fact, in the brief time that you oversaw the task force FBI agents before your promotion to deputy director, did you have any concerns, Mr. Esposito, with the way the Justice Department was handling the investigation? We had concerns, but those concerns were aired on almost a weekly basis, and we tried to come to resolution. I also was handed a note that I want to clarify for the record that uh, also I was contacted by someone else at the Justice Department regarding this memo. I was contacted by the Attorney General himself. And when was this? This was in the last month. In the last month. Did they, did she indicate there was going to be any investigation or anything about this? She just wanted to know my version of what happened. Okay. I think I'll now yield to uh, Mr. Shays. Uh, I'll have more questions for this, uh, these gentlemen later. Mr. Shays. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Mr. Gallagher, are you aware of the problems that the task force had in receiving documents from the White House? Could you repeat the question, sir? Are you aware of the problems that the task force had in receiving documents from the White House? Are you familiar with the case of the White House videos? Are you familiar with the White House emails? I am familiar with the White House emails and some of the earlier problems that we had uh, receiving uh, responses to subpoenas. It was, a, it was a difficult process. Did the problems that the task force had in getting timely compliance with the subpoenas to the White House further support the case for an independent counsel? It would have advanced the investigation to receive a more timely and thorough response to the subpoenas provided to the White House. Mr. Radek, um, yes, sir. it seems that you didn't think that the White House response to DOJ's subpoenas and requests were too bad. In your response to Mr. Labello memo, you stated that, quote, the document production issues raised by the White House with the department are the sort of routine give and take among executive branch agencies that occur all the time. You continued and said, they do indeed create some tensions and difficulties, but they are common and not the sort of conflict of interest that would justify a resort to the Independent Counsel uh, Act. Would you characterize the failure of the White House to search for thousands of missing emails as a routine give and take? I certainly uh, would not, sir, given uh, your uh, statement of the uh, facts. Of course, we were unaware of any uh, failure to search of um, White House emails at that time. It was reported uh, within the last month that the President and Vice President were interviewed by uh, Campaign Finance Task Force. And I'd like to just ask you questions uh, first. In 1996, was the Vice President asked about his role in the Buddhist Temple fundraiser? I participated in an interview of the Vice President uh, in 1996, which was a part of a preliminary investigation under the Independent Counsel Statute relating to phone calls made from the White House during the time the questions were confined to that subject and no questions were asked about uh, the Shilai Temple. In 1997, uh, was the Vice President asked about his role in the Buddhist Temple fundraiser? I was not um, in the uh, decision-making process as to what would be asked, but I don't believe he was. In 1998, was the Vice President asked about his role in the Buddhist Temple fundraiser? I don't know. 1999? Don't know. Okay. Um, why wasn't he asked? Well, I can tell you about 1996 when I participated in the interview. We were focusing in on an independent council statute with strict time limits and we weren't ready to ask the overreaching uh, questions about all of the campaign finance issues of which the Shilai Temple was a part. Why weren't you ready? Uh, we simply uh, didn't know all the facts yet. Well, if you don't know all the facts, wouldn't you start to ask questions? Yeah, but you don't ask them of, uh, of the person who is uh, presumably at the top of the pyramid. So you didn't ask in 96, you didn't ask in 97, you didn't ask in 98, and you didn't ask in 99, because you weren't ready. Well, I, again, I don't know that they weren't asked in uh, 98 or 99. Why don't you know? I, I wasn't involved in the uh, questioning of the vice president or in the task force you operations. You weren't in charge of the integrity section? I was, but the task force was run separately and outside the section. And didn't Shortly after Mr. Labella's arrival, my management role diminished. Uh, in 1996, was the president asked about his knowledge of foreign money in the presidential campaign? Foreign money in the presidential campaign? I, I can't recall. He may have been, but I, I don't recall that he was. You think he may have been asked? 
I, I was just handed a note, sir, that there were no interviews in 1996. Or I, I think that's right. I think this thing didn't get started till the end of 96. So I think the interviews you're talking about and the ones I'm talking about are in 1997. So it didn't happen in 96. Did you have any? I don't think there were any interviews in 96. And in 1997, was the president asked about his knowledge of foreign money in the presidential campaign? I'm not sure he may have been, but I don't recall that he was. And your testimony is in 1998 he was not asked uh, when Mr. Labella was put in charge? Mr. Labella arrived in September of 1997. Uh, from that time on, um, my management role diminished, and I was not part of the interview process of the president or the vice president uh, during those later uh, 1996 years. and 1997. Was the president asked about his relation with Charlie Tree? I don't believe he was interviewed in 1996. Uh, we did not ask him about that in 1997. So in 1996, certainly he wasn't asked. In 1997, was the president asked about his relationship with John Wong? No, sir. In 1996, he wasn't interviewed. But in 1997, was the president asked about his relationship with the Riyadis? I don't believe so. Would you explain uh, why you sought to use commerce to investigate and bypass the use of the FBI in investing campaign finance abuses? Um, I've described myself as an experienced prosecutor, sir, so I can tell you I, uh, I never sought to bypass the FBI. Um, uh, the John Wong allegation involved uh, allegations against an employee of the uh, uh, Department of Commerce. And uh, there were some allegations, I think, early on about a conflict of interest involving him at Commerce. Uh, my recollection is that the uh, Commerce IG started that investigation themselves. We were still in the process of gathering all kinds of information. Part of that was the information from the, uh, from the Commerce IG's office. We had informal contacts, probably from myself to Mr. Esposito, but I can't recall specifically, uh, that were getting the FBI involved. The usual process was to contact the FBI verbally, um, ask them if they would investigate, and then follow that up with a formal procedure. I think some of the references in the free memorandum that, uh, that is Exhibit 1 allude to the fact that, uh, that we were asking the FBI to investigate and had not yet made a formal referral. And part of the meeting that uh, Mr. Espo Mr. Esposito described in the earlier testimony, he said part of the purpose of the meeting was to, uh, See, what to get them my mind to make a referral. Is you had a meeting with Mr. Esposito in 1996, December of 96. The fact that you don't remember it is another issue, but the meeting took place. You're not denying that the meeting took place. I'm not. So the meeting took place. You just don't remember it. Yes, sir. And in that, we were talking about all those issues. They weren't issues that came up in 98. They were issues that came up in 95 and 96. I'm sorry, sir. What issues do you mean? Uh, with the Riyadis, with the abuse of campaign finance, with oh. John Wong. These are not new issues in 96. Or if they were new, they were there sitting for you to deal with. And if you're not going to deal with them, then an independent counsel is going to deal with them. And the irony is no independent counsel is appointed, and you're not dealing with those issues, as you've testified. And I, I don't believe I have testified that I wasn't dealing with any issues, because uh, I was. Yeah. I mean, we were beginning to conduct an investigation. The, um, it was reported within the last month that the president and the vice president were interviewed by the Campaign Finance Task Force. Is that correct? It has been so reported, yes. Is it correct that, he, um, that this was begun last month? I believe so, but I'm not sure. I don't have any independent knowledge of it. I've read the papers. And we have requested those interviews and have been told that they are part of an ongoing case and therefore cannot be produced to the committee. Is that correct? I don't know. You don't know if it's an ongoing investigation? I don't know. I believe it's part of the uh, email investigation, but I'm not sure. I'm not you, part of that. So you don't know if the president and the vice president are subject to an ongoing investigation? I do not know. Should that be a responsibility in your position? We administer now what are called the independent counsel regulations or the special counsel regulations. If there were um, an issue uh, that came to the attention of uh, someone with injustice or the attorney general that amounted to an allegation against the president or vice president, I would assume that I would be informed so that we could uh, tee that up for the attorney general. Mr. Esposito, how many times has Mr. Radek met in your office? Is it a common occurrence? 
Uh, not that in that particular office. I think that was probably one of the only meetings we had in my office on, at that level. Uh, Mr. Reddick and I had gotten together on several occasions in other offices I have occupied through the years. Are you in the same building? No. A separate building? Separate building, yes. Mr. Reddick, do you have any, uh, have you reviewed any of your calendars to see if a meeting like this took place? I have reviewed my uh, leave records. I was on leave the two days after that meeting. Uh, I don't have any calendars that indicate, uh, I don't have any calendars that indicate where I was that time. I, I don't save my calendars. I usually don't mark appointments down on calendars, so, so they don't do much good. I have a secretary who reminds me, and they don't say the calendar so, either. But you don't challenge the fact that the meeting took place? I do not challenge that fact, no. I, I've seen notes that it's on Mr. Esposito's calendar, I believe. And, that. and you don't even challenge the fact that Mr. Esposito said this, you just don't remember it? I, I do not remember it. On the other hand, I'm, I'm uh, reasonably confident I would not have said what is attributed to me in that memorandum. I'm quite confident. So how do you explain the difference between the two of you? You're obviously good friends. I cannot explain it except to say they must have misunderstood something else I said. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back to you. Let me uh, go on. Uh, there's one matter referred to in the free memo where the Justice Department was saying that uh, they were using FBI agents to investigate an allegation when, in fact, they were using the Commerce Department IAG, IG agents. You know, uh, we have heard the Justice Department say that the FBI was uh, handling this investigation uh, when, in fact, it was the Commerce Department. Why, why is there that discrepancy? I don't know why there was that discrepancy. I, um, it, it was from the very beginning um, my intention, and I think everybody on the uh, Department of Justice side of Pennsylvania Avenue, too, uh, get the Bureau involved uh, as quickly and as uh, as deeply as we could. There was never any intention to circumvent or bypass them. You know, the fact that a formal referral may have been late uh, is something I've, so, so I've this, apologized for more than once. But uh, So this, this wasn't like when you sent U.S. Marshals over to take control of the Waco uh, information for directly from uh, Director Free, where you jerked it right out of his hands. I have no knowledge of that. It didn't have anything to do with it. I mean, that, that's not comparable to that. I, I don't know. I have a, I'm not a part of that process, sir. Uh, in early 1997, this committee was uh, starting to try to get documents from the White House. We had to threaten the White House counsel with contempt of Congress before we got the documents. Did the FBI, Mr. Esposito, ever have that kind of problem with getting documents from the White House? The, uh, the only problem we had was the same problems that Mr. Gallagher and Mr. Reddick had just talked about. We had issued, there had been subpoenas issued and we're waiting for the documents to come back. Did you get them? Uh, I think eventually they got, they got them. But, but it was a long time. You didn't get them in compliance with the subpoena. Is well, that right, Mr. Gallagher? the person that would be more appropriate from the FBI standpoint to edit that was Mr. Parkinson, who was, who was here, and is the general counsel and followed this investigation. I retired in 97, so I don't know what happened after that. Well, was the public integrity section and Mr. Radick supportive of efforts that you have were, were, were putting forth to try to force the document production from the White House? Did they help you out? We had several meetings uh, to discuss uh, the production of documents. From well, what them. happened at those meetings? Did they, did, they, were, did they help you? Were they trying to be cooperative or were they an impediment? No, uh, most times they were helpful. And so you got the documents? We did not get the documents until later on. How long? How, how much later? I don't really know when the documents arrived. I, I mean, I, I didn't come to this uh, hearing to the, to, pre I'm not prepared to You're discuss You're not prepared those. for that, okay. Uh, it appears, well, uh, my time has run out. I'll now uh, yield to uh, Mr. Lantos for his time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I was listening to your questioning and the questioning of my friend, Mr. Shays, uh, the titles of two books come to my mind. One, I think it was a bestseller by Deborah Tanner, entitled You Just Don't Understand, and the other by John Gray, entitled Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Both of these, in different ways, deal with uh, fundamentally semantic issues. 
<clears throat> there is very little doubt in my mind uh, that all three of you gentlemen are telling the truth under oath as you remember it. I personally find it far less surprising than apparently the chairman does that not everybody is blessed with a photographic memory. Uh, in this town, we spend much of our lives going to meetings and listening to people. And as we do this many hours a day, five days a week or more, uh, some details just <clears throat> vanish. And uh, I think it might not be inappropriate for the committee to take a somewhat less malign and perhaps more benevolent interpretation of the apparent conflict uh, that, that is here. Um, I would like to um, begin my part of the questioning in a fairly systematic fashion. Today's hearing focuses on disagreements within the Department of Justice regarding whether an independent counsel should have been appointed to investigate the 1996 Clinton-Gore campaign. This is the third hearing this committee has held to criticize the Attorney General for not appointing an independent counsel. Let me, by the way, associate myself with the extremely laudatory comments concerning Attorney General Reno that we saw on the film clip by uh, the director of the FBI. I don't think there is a member of Congress or there is a member of this or past administrations who has more integrity than Janet Reno. Uh, and I, uh, I think uh, uh, when her record will be looked at with some degree of historical perspective, this will be obvious even to her most uh, ardent critics. With all the attention and criticism being focused on the issue of the independent counsel, some people watching this hearing may be under the impression that the campaign finance allegations against the Clinton-Gore administration have not been thoroughly investigated. Now, if this were true, it would be a serious matter. But the facts don't support this allegation. As I mentioned in my opening statement, FBI Director Louis Free has repeatedly reassured this committee that the Department of Justice's campaign finance investigation has been both aggressive and thorough. Let me read a quote from Mr. Free regarding the Department of Justice campaign finance task force. On December 9, 1997, the director of the FBI told the following to this committee. I can assure you, Mr. Chairman, that the FBI is not being impeded in any way in conducting our investigation. The task force was formed last December. Their marching orders are to go wherever the evidence leads them." End quote. On August 4, 1998, Mr. Free reiterated this point. In response to a question from the ranking member, he said that the FBI and the Department of Justice had conducted the investigation in the same manner as an independent counsel would. Here is his exchange with Mr. Waxman. Waxman. So it's fair to say in substance that you have conducted the campaign finance investigation in the same way that you would expect an independent counsel to conduct the investigation. Is that accurate? Mr. Free, yes. Now my question to you, Mr. Radek, is do you agree with Director Free's statement that the FBI and the Department of Justice have conducted a thorough investigation of the allegations of campaign finance abuse? Uh, yes, sir, I do. It's, uh, it's been some time since I've been involved in the direct management. Uh, but when I was involved, and uh, for those uh, periods of time when I was an advisor, I thought that um, uh, the strategy um, and the effort put out by the campaign for, for task force was uh, exemplary. 
In fact, um, uh, you know, Mr. LaBella's uh, differences with me have been criticized, but I thought that the, the way he sought to build the case and, and the way he went about it was, uh, was very good, and I agreed with his strategy, and I think that the, the people who are running it now are doing a jo good job. Thank you very much. Mr. Esposito, same question to you. Do you agree with Director's free statement that the FBI and the Department of Justice have conducted a thorough investigation of the allegations of campaign finance abuse? I left the FBI in October of 1997, and when I became first involved in this matter, which was late 96, I thought we had put as much resources as we possibly could, and if we needed to add resources, we did. I think both uh, made a valiant effort to, to do whatever they could to get the job done. Thank you very much. Mr. Gallagher, same question. At the end of the investigation, I think that is a very accurate statement. Thank you very much. In fact, the campaign task force has looked into every credible campaign finance allegation, ranging from conduit contributions to foreign contributions. Where it has found violations of law, it has punished them. To date, the task force has indicted 25 individuals and one corporation of campaign finance violations including such prominent Democratic fundraisers as John Wong, Charlie Tree, and Johnny Chung. The task force has also looked into a number of sensational allegations from various sources and found them without merit. It looked into an allegation by our former colleague, Jerry Solomon, that John Wong had committed espionage. The task force found that Mr. Solomon's allegation was based on nothing more than gossip at a congressional reception. According to the Los Angeles Times, and I quote, a GOP congressman who said in 1997 that he had evidence former Democratic fundraiser John Wong had passed classified information to an Indonesian company never received such reports. Notes taken by FBI agents who investigated the case show that Solomon, who headed the House Rules Committee when he made the charge, had based it on a casual remark by a Senate staff member, not on intelligence reports as he claimed at the time. And the quote from the Los Angeles Times. The task force also investigated widely publicized allegations that the Clinton administration allowed the transfer of sensitive technology to China by the Laurel Corporation in return for campaign contributions. In fact, in a speech on the House floor, the chairman raised the possibility that the administration had engaged in treasonous conduct relating to that corporation. But the task force concluded that this allegation had no basis in fact. The Los Angeles Times wrote an excellent account about that investigation. It wrote that several department officials, including Charles LaBella, felt that the Laurel accusations were baseless. According to the Los Angeles Times, Mr. LaBella felt that Laurel's chief executive was a victim of Justice Department overreaching. The RNC, the Republican National Committee, is running political commercials about the Vice President's appearance at a Buddhist temple during the 1996 campaign. But this issue was also thoroughly investigated by the FBI and the Department of Justice. An excellent summary of the facts about this investigation was recently published in the American Lawyer summarized by Stuart Taylor in the National Journal. According to the American lawyer, I quote, the evidence is now overwhelming that the temple event wasn't supposed to be a fundraiser, end quote. The article notes that the vice president's statements on the subject have been honest, accurate, and consistent, and notes that press accounts of the issue, as well as accusations leveled against the vice president, all hinge on fuzzy thinking, malevolent assumptions, and the intransigent refusal 
to credit exonerating evidence. I would like to make these articles part of the record, Mr. Chairman. Hearing no objections, so ordered. For those who doubt the thoroughness of the FBI and Justice Department investigation, we must not forget that nearly every allegation, no matter how credible, has also been investigated by this committee. This committee has issued over 900 subpoenas, 450 formal document requests, taken sworn testimony from 200 individuals, and spent over $8 million investing allegations as wide-ranging as foreign contributions, Indian casinos, influence peddling, coal deposits in Utah, conduit contributions, and the First Lady's trip to Guam. No one has stopped Chairman Burton from investigating any subject that he wants. In fact, with the consent of every single Democrat on this committee, he immunized three key witnesses in the campaign finance investigation, John Wong, Charlie Tree, and Johnny Chung, and brought them before our committee. Yet none of them had any evidence implicating any senior White House or DNC official in intentional wrongdoing. The fact of the matter is, the 1996, elect 1996 elections have been thoroughly investigated at the cost of millions and millions of taxpayer dollars. The question of whether or not an independent counsel should have been appointed may be an interesting legal issue, but ultimately it has no bearing on the facts. Director Free, who strongly disagreed with the Attorney General's decision not to seek an independent counsel, told our committee, and I quote, on issues of fact, the Attorney General and I do not disagree, end quote. As a result of the discussion we are having here today with our witnesses, <clears throat> it's a little more than an academic exercise designed to embarrass the Attorney General. It has no bearing on whether credible allegations were properly investigated. Now I have some questions for you, Mr. Radek. The Attorney General has been accused of deliberately misinterpreting the law in order to avoid appointing an independent counsel to investigate allegations of democratic wrongdoing. Chairman Burton accused her of, I quote, protecting the president and his friends. Janet Reno has defied the spirit and the letter of the independent counsel statute, end quote. In fact, from the documents that the Department of Justice provided our committee, the Attorney General appears to have applied the Independent Counsel Act in a uniform manner, regardless of who the target of the investigation was. One may agree or disagree with her reading of the law, but it is simply inaccurate and untrue to say that she has not applied the law even-handedly. In seven cases, including that of Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt, she has determined that the evidence supports the appointment of an independent counsel. <clears throat> in other cases, including cases involving the FBI director, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff Harold Dickies, CIA Director George Tenet, Vice President Gore, the Attorney General has decided <clears throat> that the evidence does not support the appointment of an independent counsel. But it appears that the legal standard was the same in each case. Mr. Radek, it is evident that, we're vigor that there were vigorous arguments about whether to appoint an independent counsel in these cases. According to the testimony of FBI Director Free, these disagreements were the result of a good faith disagreement as to legal standards. Do you agree? I do agree, and may I say with respect to your uh, comment about uh, even-handed, uh, all of my conversations with the Attorney General, she was always concerned about an even application of that statute. Um, and, and in each and every instance, she would tend to go over 
previous uh, appointments, uh, both by herself and other attorneys general, uh, and compare the decision that she was going to make on the, that was in front of her so that uh, she could consider whether she was doing a, an even application of that statute. Thank you very much. Mr. Esposito, what is your view on this subject? Uh, I really have no view on it as far as the, uh, I'm not familiar with all the uh, referrals that she, that she made and did not make. Do you have any I cases? Say, I can say this. In yep. My dealings with the Attorney General was quite extensive, especially in my last year in the FBI. I found her to be a person of high integrity, a person who would do the right thing. Thank you. Mr. Gallagher, same question. On the issue of the interpretation of the independent counsel statute, I would defer to the FBI general counsel who is available should you want to pursue that issue further. Uh, with respect to the discussion between the FBI and the Department of Justice, yes, we did disagree on interpretation of the statute. We had weekly meetings with the Attorney General that we had the opportunity, and she did invite our comments. Uh, we had debates with Lee Reddick. Uh, there was one day in April of 97, a day and a half, I recall, that we had about a 12 to 14 hour discussion on the independent counsel statute. So we did debate, we did disagree, but we had our opportunity to, to speak our opinion. Much has been said of the LaBella memo. I want to read a letter from Charles LaBella to the Attorney General dated July 20, 1998. And I want to make this whole letter part of the record, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hearing no objection, so ordered. Dear Madam Attorney General, I want to begin by reiterating what I've said on numerous occasions to you and others. During my stay in Washington, you have been courageous, diligent, and inspirational in the discharge of your duties. It has been a privilege to watch you in action. You have the keen instincts and sound judgment of a seasoned prosecutor, as well as a command of the law that any appellate lawyer would envy. Now, um, Let me return to the case of the Vice President, because <clears throat> for obvious political reasons, uh, this is not much in the media. In the case of the Vice President, it appears that it, it appears clear that everyone agreed that no case should be brought against him. The only dispute was about whether the technical re requirements of the independent counsel law were triggered. Charles LaBella, in a November 1997 memo to Mark Richard wrote, 10 out of 10 prosecutors would decide that no further investigation would be warranted. In another memo to Mark Richard on November 30, 1997, Mr. LaBella wrote, quote, on the whole I find the vice president to be credible and forthcoming. Similarly, Mr. Litt, another experienced prosecutor at the Justice Department, wrote to the Attorney General on November 22, 1998, quote, as a prosecutor, I would not bring this case. Now I have a question, <clears throat> Mr. Reddick. <clears throat> Given these quotes, it seems to me that we are not talking about a situation where anyone was trying to protect the vice president. This was simply a legal dispute among lawyers and people of good faith as to whether the final decision not to bring a case should be made by the attorney general or an independent counsel. Would you agree with this? Yes, that's the way most of us felt, that that, that was the, the import of the decision. Uh, but that still would re require us to make an analysis under the independent counsel statute. We were bound by the law. 
You have any comment on this, Mr. Esposito? No, the uh, investigation of the vice president uh, and the memos you referred to came about after I left the FBI. Mr. Gallagher? No, Mr. Lantos. Now, Mr. Raddock, Chairman Burton recently stated, I quote, Janet Reno has been blatantly protecting the president, the vice president, and their party from the outset of this scandal, end quote. But what this statement ignores is that the attorney general applied the same standard to Republicans as she did to Democrats. Has the attorney general ever declined to appoint an independent counsel in any cases involving Republicans? Yes, she has. What were those cases? I'm not at liberty to say, sir. It appears to me that if this attorney general were trying to further a partisan agenda, she would have appointed an independent counsel in those cases involving Republicans, rather than declining to do so under the same standards she did with respect to the president and the vice president. There have been allegations that Haley Barber, then chairman of the Republican National Committee, participated in a scheme in 1994 to obtain nearly $2 million in illicit foreign funds for the Republican National Committee. Mr. Radek, did the Attorney General consider appointing an independent counsel in that case? I don't recall a formal uh, decision um, on whether an independent counsel should conduct that investigation or not. But during the weekly meetings with the Attorney General, um, m matters were brought to her attention that would necessarily implicate a decision on her part as to whether or not she felt a conflict either on her own part or on the part of the Department of Justice. If she did, uh, then she uh, could consider those under the discretionary clause of the independent counsel statute. Mr. Barber is not a covered person uh, under the independent counsel statute, so the mandatory provisions would not apply. What is the status of the Haley Barber investigation? I believe it's closed, but I, I haven't been involved in it some time. Charles LaBella states in his July 16, 1998 memo as follows. For its part, the Republican National Committee had its fair share of abuses. The Barber matter is a good example of the type of disingenuous fundraising and loan transactions that were the hallmark of the 1996 election cycle. In fact, Barber's position as head of the Republican National Committee and the National Policy Forum and the liberties he took in these positions makes the one $2 million transaction even more offensive than some concocted by the DNC. Indeed, with one $2 million transaction, the RNC accomplished what it took the DNC over 100 White House coffees to accomplish." End quote. Mr. Radek, Mr. Labella's point seems to be that what Mr. Barber did was similar to if not more offensive than what Democrats were alleged to have done. Did the Attorney General apply the same standards to the Barber matter as to the alleged Democratic abuses? In terms of investigating and a decision to prosecute, absolutely. In terms of independent counsel issues, the Attorney General would not be required to make an independent counsel decision on someone who is not a covered person although she could uh, implicate the statute under the discretionary clause. Uh, but I can say that uh, as with that, as with all uh, matters, independent counsel statute or otherwise, uh, one thing the Attorney General was always uh, concerned about was, was the even application of the law, the criminal law, and the independent counsel statute. Mr. Esposito, do you agree that the Attorney General acted even-handedly? I, I have no comment because I'm not familiar with the matter that you're discussing. Do you have any reason to doubt that she acted even-handedly? No. On all matters that I've dealt with her on, she acted uh, very uh, even-handedly. Mr. Gallagher? On all matters that I observe, she, the Attorney General uh, certainly acted even-handedly. Among the numerous documents the Department of Justice has provided to this committee, 
connection with the 1996 campaign finance investigations is a memo written by you, Mr. Radek, dated September 25, 1998, to Assistant Attorney General James Robinson of the Criminal Division. In that memo, you state, the issues in the Republican National Committee investigation are largely identical to the issues in the Democratic National Committee investigation. The principal difference is that the facts of the RNC media project have not been fleshed out as much." End quote. Did you think these issues were similar? I thought the issues were similar. That's not to say that I thought they should have been fleshed out. I thought that the entire common cause allegation um, was did not allege a crime. And, and for that reason, uh, from, from the very beginning, I thought all arguments that it should be investigated or that it should be uh, have a, an independent counsel uh, appointed on that issue um, were, were, just had no merit. For purposes of clarification, let me say the common cause issue is this, that both the Republicans and the Democrats engaged in a pattern of using soft money to pay for issue ads, which ads were for the purpose of help, helping them in the election. And Common Cause argued that that caused those to become, uh, in their character, federal, exp federal money expenditures or hard money expenditures. In a November 22, 1998 memo, Robert Litt wrote that a lesser standard of imputed knowledge was apparently applied to the director of the FBI regarding whether he testified falsely to Congress on March 5, 1997, and to the vice president. Specifically, Mr. Litt states, quote, in the free matter, there was evidence from which one could have inferred that Director Free knew his statement was false, yet the Attorney General found this outweighed by other evidence showing that he did not. Mr. Radek, do you see a difference between how the Attorney General handled the decision about whether to appoint an independent counsel to investigate Director Free and how she handled the decision about whether to appoint an independent counsel to investigate the Vice President? I see no difference. I think they were uh, quite similar. And I thought she, uh, she considered one when applying the statute to the other. Now, over the past uh, several years, <clears throat> Chairman Burton and others have followed a pattern of making sensational allegations before the facts have been gathered. Further investigation has shown that many of these allegations turn out to be unsubstantiated. I wish to offer a few examples of these unsubstantiated allegations. In November 1995, Mr. Burton suggested on the House floor that Deputy White House Counsel Vince Foster had been murdered. What are the facts? Investigations by the Federal Park Police, Independent Counsel Robert Fisk, and Independent Counsel Kenneth Starr have all concluded that there was no evidence of any wrongdoing connected to Mr. Foster's suicide. An allegation was made in January 1996 by Mr. Burton, stating that the White House had illegally contacted the IRS to harass fired White House employees. What are the facts? Investigations by the General Accounting Office the Department of Justice and the Department of Treasury all concluded that there was no improper contact between the White House and the IRS. In June 1996... Gentlemen's time uh, has expired. Uh, the uh, chair recognizes uh, majority counsel for 30 minutes. Good afternoon. I know it's been a fairly long day and I've got a lot to cover, so I'll go as quickly as I can. Um, a couple of preliminary things. Mr. Radek, I wanted to ask you about a number of specific memos, but just some 
housekeeping matters. Um, does the public integrity section, Mr. Radick, now handle matters that relate to appointments of special counsels under the Department of Justice regulations? We and will we will administer. We haven't uh, had the opportunity to do so yet. The uh, special counsel regulations, yes, sir. Are there any pending decisions that pertain to appointing special counsels in any campaign uh, finance matters? There are not. In Mr. Radek, in uh, July of 1997, I believe July 6 of 1997, you gave an interview to the Sunday New York Times Magazine, and you went on the record as saying, "quote." Institutionally, the independent counsel statute is an insult, unquote. Prior to your statement, the Attorney General had supported the statute both very publicly and under oath. At the time you made the statement in 1997, were you authorized to make that statement by anybody at the Department of Justice? Uh, not specifically. I was authorized to give that interview by the Department. But specifically on taking the point about the independent counsel statute being an insult, did, did you ask anybody at the Department of Justice whether that was an appropriate official position of the department? I uh, did not, but of course that I wasn't giving an official position of the department. I was giving my own opinion. Did, did you ask anybody in advance of giving that position? I did uh, not. May I say, sir, that um, uh, with respect to that remark, while the, maybe the word of the years, the use of the word insult is, uh, is unfortunate, um, what I said and what I meant is a position that has been agreed with by many, uh, most particularly uh, uh, when the statute was being reenacted time before last, uh, Associate Attorney General Rudy Giuliani uh, testified before the uh, Senate Committee on Governmental Affor Affairs uh, against the uh, reenactment of the statute, and he said, uh, the system depends quite properly on the integrity of the Department of Justice personnel. The assumption upon which the special prosecutor law is premised that the Department of Justice should not be trusted to investigate or prosecute certain federal offenses is simply unfounded. There is no basis for assuming that Department of Justice personnel cannot fairly and thoroughly investigate crimes by public officials. The conduct of such investigations and prosecutions should be returned to those professionals in the Department of Justice who are best equipped to handle them. Okay, now, I, and I understand, and there are many people that object to various parts of the independent counsel statute, but, but what I was asking was when the, the attorney general had taken a very public and a position under oath about the statute, whether you had asked in advance of going out and making that statement, whether that was an appropriate statement to make. But let me move on to something else. Um, e Exhibit 60, which there, there's no need to turn to. I'm going to ask a very specific question about it, um, is a memorandum from your deputy to uh, Assistant Attorney General Robinson. And it notes that, um, I'll read the quote, Lee J. Radick, Chief of Public Integrity Section, has been recused from this matter. And he was discussing matters pertaining to investigations of Harold Ickes. And the simple question is, why were you recused from that matter? <clears throat> I was involved in the uh, Ickes Independent Counsel matter up till uh, uh, close to the end. Um, near the end of the investigation, uh, independent counsel Carol Bruce uh, contacted, uh, who had been in touch with the task force uh, because there were some related matters, um, indicated that there might be a close connection between uh, the investigation that was ongoing with respect to Mr. Ickes and her investigation of Mr. Babbitt. I was recused from the Babbitt investigation because the subject of that investigation was a close friend of my wife's family. During the last couple of years, the committee has had some interest in some investigations, internal investigations within the Department of Justice of leaks about sensitive campaign finance matters or statements that have been made by senior Department of Justice officials. And, and we are well aware that the Department of Justice Office of Professional Responsibility has conducted a number of leak investigations within the Department of Justice. Um, first of all, Mr. Radick, have you been questioned in any of these leak investigations? I have been um, asked to um, um, sign affidavits or statements, sworn statements, uh, in a number of leak investigations, some related to campaign finance, yes. But I, that sounds like the answer is no. You've not been questioned. You've just been presented with an affidavit to sign. And we can 
move a bit faster if you'll just answer the simple question. Yeah, I, the answer is I don't recall being interviewed, but uh, I would have to check my records or rather check with OPR to be sure. I don't recall being interviewed. Are, in any are you aware of whether the Department of Justice has identified the sources of any of the leaks about the campaign finance investigations that have been ongoing? No, I'm not aware. I'll put, I'll put an example up of, of something, and then I wanted to ask you a few questions about that. On uh, October 2nd, 1998, the following statement appeared in the Washington Post, and the, the quote is, and a senior Justice Department official said that some investigators have concluded that John Wong does not have information that would support the prosecution of the Democratic officials who received and spent the funds he raised, or the White House officials who promoted his career in Washington. Now, I'm, I'm well aware that the Department of Justice has conducted an investigation about this leak. If I were a defense attorney, I would be very happy to receive information about this because it talks about the substance of the investigation. It's a, it's a tip-off. And if, if I were a defense attorney, I would understand at that point that I could hang tough and I wouldn't have to provide much cooperation because this says that senior DOJ officials have come to a conclusion. Now, when you were making determinations about whether to recommend an independent counsel appointment, did you ever take any of these leaks into account when you made your recommendations? In what way? Well, that it was a matter that perhaps uh, necessitated an outside look at the, uh, at the investigation. For example, if you mean individuals they, they... privy to sensitive information are leaking information to defense counsel, that stands for the proposition perhaps that somebody from outside should be in charge. Uh, I, I can't say that I took any leak uh, into consideration as a basis of a conflict of interest for the department, no. Um, I don't recall any uh, uh, leaks that were detrimental to the investigation on any of the particular independent counsel matters. There may have been some, I just don't recall. But um, I agree with your statement that uh, leaks are just devastating and they can be um, they can uh, just derail an investigation uh, as, as quick as anything, and, uh, and it was quite upsetting to see leaks in this matter as well as any other. Well, fr from our perspective, one of the things you said in the New York Times interview comes to bear here, and that is when you were, when you were quoted, you took the very public position in the New York Times, you said the statute is a clear enunciation by the legislative branch that we cannot be trusted on certain species of cases. And when you have individuals who are leaking information that's beneficial to offense attorneys, that in some respects goes to support the underlying proposition. Well, sir, what you're saying is that, uh, uh, that the Department of Justice prosecutors who are trying to do these cases are uh, responsible for the leaks, and I wouldn't make that uh, leap of faith. I don't know who is responsible for them, but I don't think it was anybody on the uh, investigative and prosecutive teams. Well. But therein lies the question for us. It's somebody privy to the information, and that person is providing the information in a public way, and it ultimately gets back to the defense counsel. And I, I think you answered the question. The question was, did you take the considering whether somebody independent should handle these cases? And your answer was no. It's that, that's that's a fair characterization. Um, One of the things that's been troubling, this is a small point, I'll move away from it, but you know, you've been very public and you've attended the White House Correspondence Center, the Radio and Television Correspondence Center. Just a, a brief, some brief help on whether you think it's appropriate for the, the head of the public integrity section, which all of Department of Justice should be non-political, but to be the guest of media while there are ongoing leak investigations and there are sensitive investigations of of corruption matters. Is, is it an appropriate thing for the head of the public integrity section to go to events like that? Yeah, I thought it was appropriate or I wouldn't have gone. I, uh, I don't leak. And I think my reputation in the department is solid enough that uh, no, people aren't going to believe that I'm leaking. And, uh, and so I didn't feel many qualms about going to such events. Or one I saw of, you, I believe, at one of them. One of the, one of the things that um, you had you had said earlier about the meeting with Mr. Esposito and Mr. Gallagher was that you were not in the habit of lying to them and consequently that stands for the proposition you wouldn't have made something up when you were talking to them. Uh, I want to focus on a few things that, that came out in memoranda that you wrote and, and not theories or legal theories or speculative aspects but some factual matters that were put down in memoranda that you wrote and then there were responses to those factual matters 
from other individuals. And the first one I wanted to take a look at, and, and I think there's a book there in front of you, exhibit uh, number seven in front of you. Um, it's a memo from yourself to the acting assistant attorney general, Mark Richard, and the subject of the memo is, and I'll, I'll quote the subject line, the position of the Office of Legal Counsel on legal issues relevant to the independent counsel matter involving Vice President Gore. And I'm, I'm sorry, Exhibit 7? Exhibit 7, yes. There's, there's a memo from yourself on the subject that I just described. Mm -hmm. And if you turn five pages in, into the, the exhibit, there's another memorandum, and it's from the acting head of the Office of Legal Counsel to yourself. Yes. And it was drafted on the same day as your memorandum to, to Mr. Richard. And I just wanted to read a couple of quotes from this memo and, and ask you some things about them. At the end of the first paragraph, the, the head of Office of Legal Counsel states, quote, as I have already expressed to you, we have several concerns about this memorandum, which I will briefly describe below. She goes on at the end of the second paragraph, uh, she goes on to state, quote, your memo unfortunately leaves a different and incorrect impression. And then following from that, at the start of the third paragraph, um, again, it's the acting head of the Office of Legal Counsel states, quote, to the extent that the memorandum attempts to report remarks made by OLC lawyers at the meeting, it does so incorrectly and incompletely. Thus, not only did the memorandum leave the mistaken impression that, quote, OLC positions, unquote, were expressed, it also mischaracterized the comments that individual lawyers offered during the meetings, during the meeting, singular. Do you recall whether Don Johnson spoke to you about this memorandum? I don't recall whether she spoke to me about this memorandum. Uh, she spoke to me about these issues. Now, <clears throat> Ms. Johnson was a Clinton appointee, correct? Head of Office of Legal Counsel? Uh, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure she was a political appointee. She was acting at this time, but, um, but she was head of Office of Legal Counsel. Okay, well, moving to another, another subject, and we are, talked... Are we going to put this memo in context as to what it is? It's, a, it's, well, a, the, it's what, an argy-bargy with uh, some people who said some things at a meeting, and, uh, and the, the fact is that uh, OLC didn't want to be put on the record as taking any position. And so it was in uh, uh, Don Johnson's interest to, uh, to take off the record what my memorandum said that they had said. In fact, uh, I double-checked with uh, several people at the meeting uh, who agreed with me that my memo was accurate. So you dispute her characterization? I do. She and did at the time. When, when, when the, she... Would counsel yield? Certainly. Um, I'm glad uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Radick's memory is a little bit better. Uh, maybe we can go back to something else and see if your memory uh, is better. We talked earlier about the uh, memorandum from the director of uh, the FBI to Mr. Esposito dated December 9th, 1996. And uh, the meeting uh, between uh, Mr. Esposito and yourself that you acknowledged took place, all you, although you apparently have no recollection of what was said there. Uh, have you ever seen this memo before? December 9th, 1996, from Director of FBI yes. to Mr. Esposito. Yes, I saw this memo for the first time on the 4th of last month. And when? The 4th of last month. You never, you never saw it before then? No. Did you ever hear about it before then? No. You're quite sure? Uh, yes, I heard about it the day before. I'm sorry. Okay. So your memory is very clear on the fact that as you sit here today, your testimony is that you never saw this memo before, never even heard about this memo before just recently. Yes. Okay. Uh, at the time you now say you first saw this memo just recently, did you uh, place a memo into the record to the director of the FBI, to the Attorney General, to Mr. Esposito or anybody else disputing uh, the uh, characterization of your meeting and your comments with Mr. Esposito? I did not. Okay. Why not? Well, for the, the one thing is I can't even remember the meeting. 
Um, so it's difficult for me to uh, to categorically deny uh, something that a meeting that wasn't there. So you're not you're not but, categorically denying but, these these comments then. Yes. You are. Oh, oh yes. I, I, well, I'm not categorically denying them. I'm saying that I don't remember the meeting. I don't remember saying them, and it is not something I would have said. Well, I thought earlier you said you remember the meeting. You just didn't remember I, the comments. I do not remember the meeting. Okay. Well, we're getting somewhere, I suppose. Now, uh, I'd like to uh, place in the record uh, a copy, uh, and I believe uh, if we could have somebody uh, give these copies to the uh, witnesses. Uh, this is a page, I believe, Mr. Esposito, you can testify to this when you see it, uh, of your uh, uh, calendar, even though other people say that they don't keep calendars, apparently you find them useful. I just happened to look through some boxes and actually found my 1996 calendar. Okay. And uh, this page uh, is, in fact, is it not a, uh, an accurate photocopy of a page from your calendar? from the month of November 1996, uh, the dates of November 18, 19, and 20, 1996? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, is it uh, an accurate uh, photocopy of the original? Yes. Okay. And uh, uh, was it uh, uh, kept at the time in normal course of business? Yes, by either myself or my secretary. Okay. And uh, does it not, as the very last entry on the page at 4.30 p.m. on November 20th, uh, indicate uh, your meeting with Mr. Radick and his deputy? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, Mr. Radick, you have a copy of this. Does this refresh your recollection in any way? It doesn't, and I, I've seen this this morning, and it did not at that time. Okay. So you still maintain here under oath that you have absolutely no recollection of that meeting having taken place? That's correct. Okay. Uh, but you do state that you never made statements such as related by the director of FBI uh, to Mr. Esposito uh, in the middle of uh, the memo dated December 9th, 1996, that you were under pressure and that the Attorney general, General's job might hang in the balance. I don't recall the meeting. I don't recall the conversation. I am sure that... Is it I possible that you've made those statements? It is not possible in my mind because... Not, not the statements you just said, but the statement in the memo which says that I was under pressure because the Attorney General's job hangs in the balance. No, that's, that's not what it says. I'm, I'm not misquoting it. You are. Uh, all I'm saying is whatever these statements were, I'm not characterizing them in any way. I'm saying whatever these statements were as reflected in this memo by the head of the FBI to Mr. Esposito, reflecting also uh, the fact that the director of the FBI related these statements to the Attorney General. Uh, you have, one, no recollection of your having made them, and you dispute them. Is that accurate? The statements in this memo. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, therefore, when you first saw this memo and you saw statements attributed to you that you very apparently very strongly disagree with, you took no steps to correct the record. I informed the Deputy Attorney General that um, I read up of what I've just told you, that I you, didn't you recall. Took, you took no steps uh, verifiable on the record to correct the record. You didn't send anybody a memo. You just told somebody something. I told the Deputy Attorney General that uh, I had, uh, did not remember the meeting and that this is not something I would have said. Okay. You, you didn't relate that to the head of the FBI? No, I don't uh, usually talk to the head of the FBI. You don't usually talk to the head of the FBI? That's correct. So you met with Mr. Esposito? I deal with Mr. Free's uh, uh, subordinates, yes. Okay. Does it, do, you, do you take any umbrage or exception to, uh, to these statements attributed to you? I do, sir. They're not correct, in my opinion. But you've taken absolutely no steps on the record to correct them? I've informed the Deputy Attorney General that they were incorrect, in my opinion. Okay. Counselor? Just going back to our, our previous discussion, um, effectively you said that the head of the Office of Legal Counsel was misstating, in fact, lying in this memorandum. He, she, she said very clearly that um, your memorandum mischaracterized comments that individual lawyers offered during the meeting. Um, it also says that uh, it reports remarks made by OLC lawyers at the meeting. It does so incorrectly and incompletely. And you, obviously dispute that. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, 
just turning briefly to the common cause allegations, um, when were the common cause allegations formally closed out? Uh, that's a matter of some dispute. Um, it was my impression that uh, when the Attorney General testified before Congress saying that she had closed them out, that uh, that ended the matter. But you have to understand that the Attorney General had uh, one working uh, command throughout the uh, uh, campaign finance investigation, and that is leave no stone unturned. If we heard it once, we heard it a thousand times, and I'm sure these gentlemen uh, alongside of me will support that. Uh, when Mr. LaBella came on board uh, and brought Mr. Clark with him from uh, San Diego, um, they chose to re-examine... Is, is that Mr. Steve Clark? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, they chose to re-examine that issue. So um, it was probably never closed for this reason. The Attorney General had said early on she wasn't going to close anything unless the director of the FBI signed off on it. I'm sure that the director of the FBI never signed off on the common cause uh, allegation. So to the extent that in my answer to Mr. Lobella's memo, I said that uh, uh, that it had been disposed of, uh, technically I was incorrect. Okay, well, you know, let's go beyond technically here. You said in your memorandum, quote, the common cause allegations were thoroughly considered, analyzed at length, and closed on their merits. There's no ambiguity there. Now, apparently, uh, 20 days after you made this very strong pronouncement, um, the head of the criminal division, which would be your boss, uh, said the uh, said that there should be a preliminary investigation to possibly consider appointment of an independent counsel. And it surprises me that you've taken a very strong position in a memorandum to a superior of yours about something being closed, and yet 20 days later your superior is saying we should do an independent counsel investigation. So oh, there's an. In I'm sorry, were you finished? But I mean, the the thing is, you've just said now that that it, it wasn't closed, so there was. Oh, there's a there's an inter statement. but there's an intervening event. Uh, the intervening event was that the auditors at the FEC came out with a finding that this could violate the statute. The first time the FEC had given any hint that this might possibly be a violation. But you know, there and we still have this situation. Are you saying that the allegations were thoroughly considered? analyzed at length and closed on their merits. If there was an ongoing allegation somewhere else or investigation somewhere else, then perhaps that is entirely not accurate either. Well, the, the FEC is not the Department of Justice, and in fact, it was always my position that it was up to the FEC to determine whether this was a violation. What I'm saying is, it was my opinion at the time I wrote that, that it was closed. I ignored the fact, and I, although I was uh, vaguely aware of it, I, I'm more than vaguely aware of it, I was aware of it, that Mr. LaBella had been revisiting the issue. Yet the Attorney General had testified that uh, she had resolved the matter, so in my mind that resolved it. The fact that Mr. Robinson reopened it was due to an intervening fact, and that was the audit report. So the, the, Mr. Robinson's uh, uh, memo, in my opinion, were not inconsistent, but my opinion was inaccurate because I had uh, ignored the fact that Mr. LaBella and Mr. Clark had been re-examining it. Okay. Um, and I apologize to Mr. LaBella after I had uh, made that mistake and he pointed it out. Well, it's, it's just, this is important for us to go through. There appears to be a series of these types of errors or misrepresentations. And one of the concerns that we have is you're providing advice to your superiors on appointment of an independent counsel. And, you know, one would hope that the advice you were providing was accurate That's great. And, and full. And there appears to be a problem with this one. Now, Exhibit 11 uh, is a memo from yourself to the Acting Assistant Attorney General, Mark Richard. Again, he's the head of... Uh, the division which the public integrity section is in. The memo is dated November 21, 1997. And on page five of this memo, you uh, state very clearly, quote, it is worthy of note that the four prosecutors who participated in the interview each found the vice president to be credible and forthcoming. Now, nine days later, Mr. LaBella took a very different view from the one that you advanced in this memorandum. Exhibit 16, if you turn to that, is a memo from Mr. LaBella to the Attorney General. The memo provides a recommendation that the Attorney General appoint an independent counsel to investigate the Vice President. But of particular interest in this, concept, in this context is the part where Mr. LaBella takes issue with the way you characterized the view of the prosecutors who were in the interview with the Vice President. 
And, and this is what Mr. Labella told the Attorney General, quote, page. Um, and it's page four of um, Mr. Labella's memo to the Attorney General. He said, although the memorandum states that the four prosecutors, and he's referring to your memo, he says, although the memorandum states that the four prosecutors who participated in the interview of the Vice President each found him to be credible and forthcoming, this somewhat overstates my own impression of the interview. While the Vice President did present his case well and plausibly, there were certain answers which seemed somewhat less convincing than others. And it, it appears again here there's somewhat of a stark contrast on a factual representation in a memo that you wrote, and then Mr. Labella comes back after the fact and takes issue with the way you characterize this factual matter. Well, I think it's stark contrast, uh, grossly overstates it. Uh, my memo was based upon uh, remarks that Mr. Labella made to me shortly after we interviewed the Vice President. Um, in which uh, case he gave me the impression that he clearly thought the vice president was credible. Um, the first that I learned that he was having some problems with it was when I saw his memo disagreeing with that. Well, again, it's another one. And, and again, I don't think the uh, contrast is so stark. He says uh, that he had some problems with it. There was, um, as a result of this disagreement, an investigation conducted by another deputy assistant attorney general with, with no conclusions drawn as to... Well, it was certainly significant of, enough for him to come back and put on paper uh, a disagreement with the way you'd characterize him. And, and he goes on. That's not the only place. In page four as well, he goes on. And to, be, to, to present the whole thing fully, he does say, this is not to say that I found the vice president to be untruthful. On the contrary, on the whole, I too found him to be credible and forthcoming. However, his answers to one or two questions gave me sufficient pause so that I would not rely on his interview as a bulwark for a determination not to appoint an independent counsel, which again is a contrast to the way you characterized his state of mind. Contrast, but again, that's the first I heard of it, and I can assure you that we didn't rely on his statement as a bulwark either. Now, what were the views of the other agents um, referred to Mr. Labella? referred to by Mr. Labella. Did, did, did they all agree with your characterization of the way they thought about the interview, or did they agree with Mr. Labella's characterization? There was uh, some dispute as to what, they, uh, what their characterization, um, uh, what they believed, which they agreed with. So you we, put down their views in a memo, and then you found out later there was some dispute from the other people as to what their state of mind was. Is I'm that sorry, correct? I, I, I'm not sure to what you're referring. Well, you, you described that there was some dispute. Yes. In terms of the other prosecutors, other than Mr. Lavella. Oh, no. I thought you said agents. I'm sorry. No, I, I don't think there was any dispute as with respect to the other prosecutors. So only Mr. Lavella was the one that took issue that, with that's the That's my best said. recollection, yeah. Okay. Um, just one, one last, my time will soon run out. Um, exhibit 35. Uh, is a memorandum that uh, if you just take a moment to refer to that. You had completed a memorandum on, on August 24, 1998 regarding the perjury investigations of the Vice President and the following day a task force prosecutor took exception to a number of the factual points that you made in your memorandum. And I wanted to go through and read a couple of the factual points and differences and, and ultimately get your comment on that. Um, this is the, the task force prosecutor re responding to your memo. And he says, in Radick's memo, he indicated that only Leon Panetta recalled discussing hard and soft money splits in conjunction with the media fund. In fact, Panetta was not the only person with such a recollection. The task force attorney's memo states that, quote, we now have uh, Panetta, Marshall, and the contemporaneous Strauss notes with quotation marks suggesting direct statements, all indicating that this topic was raised. On the other side is a group of people who basically don't recall. This is a classic white collar scenario. Yet the memorandum, which is your memo, uh, gives more credence to the don't recalls than to the explicit memories. Certainly, a lineup like this warrants additional inquiry. Now, the, the prosecutor goes on, and he says, and here's another quote, the uh, Radic memo says Panetta's impression was that the vice president was following the hard money discussion. 
The agent's notes reflect that Panetta said the vice president was listening attentively. So he takes exception with your characterization of how the vice president was, um, whether it was an impression or whether he was actually following something uh, attentively. Uh, he goes on in the memo to say, um, to point out that, that you say in your memo that Panetta may have contradicted himself. Excuse me, the council's time has expired, but I'm, I have the next five minutes, so I'll yield those uh, yield to you to, to conclude that question. Uh, just <clears throat> providing the quote there, the, he indicates that your memo says that Panetta may have contradicted himself. However, he says the agent's note do not support this. Panetta recalled the general topic, though not the specific details. Take one moment and reset this clock. At another point, uh, the prosecutor says, and I quote, the agents disagree vehemently with the characterization of the Panetta interviews. Specifically, they assert that he did not change his statement, although the Radic memo says he did so three times. So here the prosecutor is saying, in your memo, you said Panetta changed his, uh, his view three times. And according to the prosecutor, the agents are disagreeing vehemently with, with your characterization. Uh, the, the memo also goes on to uh, criticize your memo for failing to mention that the vice president himself had stated in a press conference that the phone calls were designed to solicit money for the campaign. Uh, according to the memo, Gore's press conference stood in stark contrast to his statements during later FBI interviews. So again, he takes issue with another of your characterizations. Um, In another point, he, he points out that in, in your memorandum, uh, you suggest, quote, that the media fund was not an item in the DNC budget during the spring and summer of 1995. However, Watson, Bobby Watson, a former executive director of the DNC, recalled the agenda of the June 8, 1995 meeting included the media fund. So he's saying that there's a factual disagreement where you're saying it doesn't do one thing, and he's saying that, that Bobby Watson gave different testimony. Um, just a couple of other points. He, he notes that your memorandum suggests that uh, Marvin Rosen recalled the focus of the fundraising proposals presented to the president and vice president during the November meeting was on raising soft money. And the agent's notes indicate that Rosen had no recall whether the events were intended to raise soft or hard money. So you've made one characterization about what Marvin Rosen thought, and the prosecutor is saying that the agents say that's not correct at all. And there are a number of other statements along this line where he just walks through the factual statements that you've made in, in, in your recommendation to your superior, and, and he simply points out that your factual assessments are incorrect. Um, I guess the simple question is, how could you and the person who wrote this memo be so far apart on factual matters? Well, the fact is we were not far apart on factual matters. Uh, the, the factual matters that you discuss are, are small, uh, for the most part insignificant. Um, for instance, the, uh, the, the debate... Let me, let, me, let me interrupt there just for a second. Yes, sir. How is it insignificant? Who, who was the person who wrote that memo? It's a... Uh, it was Mr. Mr. LaBella's deputy. Yeah, Mr. What was his name? We had it a while ago. What well, is... it's been redacted from our... What's his name? Well, anyhow, I have his name, and I'll look it up here in just a minute. But the fact of the matter is, if it's the one I'm thinking of, he felt so strongly about it, he resigned. No, no, that's, that's not Mr. Clark. It's someone else. Well, it's not Mr. Clark, but Mr. Clark was one of those who felt so fed up with it, he resigned. Mr. Clark was, uh, was doing the analysis on the common cause allegation and, and left, and you have his memoranda as to Yes, I read his memorandum. Judy Fagan. Yeah, I guess is the lady's name. But she had uh, just substantial differences, as did Mr. Clark in the way you were conducting, uh, you know, the investigation. Yes, they did. They were both uh, from uh, San Diego, and Mr. LaBella brought them with him. Oh, and it's because of Mr. LaBella? I did not say that, sir. I just was describing well, who What they in the were. world would you say they're both from San Diego for then? I was describing who they were. Well, the fact of the matter is, Mr. LaBella didn't like the way it was being handled. She didn't like the way it was being handled. Mr. Clark didn't like the way it was being handled. And they quit. 
So there was a strong, strong difference in the way you were conducting this and the way they thought it should be conducted. Mr. Clark quit. Mr. Yes, that's right. Mr. LaBella left to become the U.S. Attorney, acting U.S. Attorney in San Diego. Well, Mr. Let's talk about Mr. LaBella. Because of Mr. LaBella's memo, he was in line to become the U.S. Attorney in San Diego, and he was passed over. He was passed over, and, and a subordinate of his became the U.S. Attorney. And to everybody who followed this, it looked as though, and I think that you probably would agree if you weren't smiling, that uh, Mr. LaBella was passed over because he, he, he was so vehement in his opposition and he felt like there should be an independent counsel and you folks at uh, Top uh, Brass of Justice didn't want it. Well, thanks for the compliment about Top Brass, Mr. Chairman. But uh, with respect to Mr. LaBella's appointment, I can assure you that I have nothing to do with it. But you know better than I that the person who appoints and names the U.S. Attorney is, 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 is a member of this branch of government and not the executive branch. And Mr. LaBella's appointment uh, nomination was uh, was uh, handled the same way as all are, and that's by a senator in the United States Senate. Uh, uh, and, and then confirmed. Uh, uh, the recommendations made by the Attorney General, and then the final decisions made by the Judiciary the Recommendation is made by the United States Senator for that party, whatever the the, uh, the state is. That's the way all well, U.S. attorneys Well, uh, if, if that's the case, it's the sister-in-law of uh, one of the uh, members of the White House. But, you know, uh, but, but don't Mr. put that on the Department of Justice is all I'm saying. Mr. Lantos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me change the subject for a minute. <clears throat> Senator Orrin Hatch, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, has stated, and I quote, that he's not nearly as concerned with the allegations about some of the occurrences with the White House with regard to a phone call or phone calls that may have been made although they may unknowingly have violated the law, end quote. Nevertheless, the LaBella Memorandum cites the Vice President's telephone call solicitations from the White House as grounds for seeking an independent counsel. Mr. Raddock, in deciding whether to prosecute a case such as this one, is it appropriate to look at prior Justice Department precedent on when prosecutions involving solicitations made from federal property were initiated? When uh, making a decision whether to prosecute or in whether making a decision to have an independent counsel, yes, sir. You agree with that, Mr. Esposito? I've never seen the LaBella memo. Well, I'm, I'm raising an issue irrespective of the principle. If certain violations are not prosecuted historically, is it fair not to have them prosecuted currently? Yeah, I think the Department of Justice looks at past precedent. I agree with that. And do you think that's a proper procedure? Yes. How about you, Mr. Gallagher? <clears throat> with all due respect, Mr. Lantos, I'd have to defer to the FBI General Counsel that has reviewed this entire matter and would be more appropriate to comment to that question. I can't speak to it personally. <clears throat> Was the Justice Department correct, uh, uh, Mr. Raddock, to consider the precedent that in 1988 the Department learned that Senators Orrin Hatch and Gordon Humphrey had sent solicitation letters to federal employees, but the Department of Justice declined to prosecute? The, the outcome of that line of inquiry within the department uh, was that it was, uh, it was clear that the department's prior practice was not to prosecute solicitations on federal property, uh, a 607 violation, without aggravating circumstances. To the extent that those cases, uh, those matters you cite uh, stand for that principle, it would be proper to consider them, yes. Was the Department of Justice correct, Mr. Adek, to consider the precedent that in 1976 the department declined prosecution when federal employees complained about receiving solicitation letters from then-President Jerry Ford for Republican congressional candidates, letters that the department found were, I quote, patently coercive in content and tone? Again, to the extent that there were no aggravated circumstances, that would be one that should be factored in as to what the department's practice, prior practice had been, and therefore become a policy. Let me go back to the common cause issue. 
During his opening statement, um, the chairman repeatedly referred to the Justice Department's handling of a complaint filed by the campaign finance watchdog group Common Cause. He referred to several quotes by Mr. Labella expressing his frustration at the department's handling of this complaint. Now, it's important that we understand what actually occurred with regard to the Common Cause complaint, because when we have all the facts before us, the dispute between Mr. Labella and others at the Justice Department is ultimately utterly insignificant. First, I think some background may be useful. Following the 1996 campaign, Common Cause filed a complaint with the Justice Department alleging that issue ads run by both the Democratic National Committee and the Republican National Committee violated federal campaign finance laws. Common Cause further alleged that the White House had violated campaign finance laws by using DNC issue ads to evade campaign spending restrictions. My question is this. After Mr. LaBella submitted the memo the chairman quoted, Attorney General Reno determined that a preliminary investigation of the Common Cause allegations should be triggered under the Independent Counsel Act. Is that accurate, Mr. Raddick? It's accurate in terms of time, but the triggering event for the Common Cause investigation was the audit report from the FEC auditors. Right. Can you tell us what that investigation entailed? The investigation was, uh, was primarily an analysis of known facts. And the known facts were these. There were a whole bunch of issue ads, and we knew what they were and what they said. And they were ads that clearly promoted, for, on the part of the Democrats, a democratic message, and on the part of the Republicans, a Republican message. Then there were a whole lot of rulings out of the Federal Election Commission that, uh, that some really good legal minds sweated and strained over for a long time, trying to figure out exactly what the state of the law was. Um, there was not much in terms of factual development or issue because um, uh, it was assumed that the president was involved in it. I mean, there was testimony that he was in on the planning of the issue ads, the vice president the same. Um, and uh, the, the, if, if, uh, if we were to look at the Republicans under the independent counsel statute, that would be under a conflict of interest. Um, what, was, what was difficult was the law. We had to figure under the independent counsel statute, we had to determine whether there was a violation of the law. My position is and was that it's not a violation until the FEC says it's a violation. And in a, particularly in a murky area like this where the FEC had hinted that it's not a violation, in the end came out and said it wasn't a violation. Um, it seemed to me to be uh, close to irresponsible to even conduct an a criminal investigation of people who, had, who were taking advantage of this loophole. Is it fair to say that there was considerable disagreement within the department regarding the laws regulating issue advertising? There was considerable disagreement with the department on almost every issue, um, depending on the issue. But yes, common cause was one that people um, found very difficult conceptually, and um, there was a certain sort of basic appeal to this, to the simply stated issue as stated by common cause until you look behind it and examine the law and the fact that soft money could be used on, on the most uh, blatant of federal campaigns because it was usable for state and local candidates. And, uh, and so the law was really uh, difficult to get through, and yes, there were considerable disagreements throughout that process. Is it also fair to say that there was considerable disagreement among election law experts regarding the laws regulating issue advertising? Uh, yes, that's correct. Can you also explain the division of election law enforcement responsibilities between the FEC and the Department of Justice? The Federal Election Commission is the entity that has uh, exclusive jurisdiction for interpreting the statute and administering it civilly. The Department of Justice enforces it criminally. At the conclusion of the preliminary inquiry, the Attorney General determined that an independent counsel should not be appointed to investigate the common cause complaint. She had two reasons for her decision. The first reason 
is that it would be too difficult, if not impossible, to bring successful prosecutions against those who had relied on advice of counsel from election law experts who had good faith interpretations of the laws. The second reason is that it was the long-standing policy of the Department of Justice to defer to the FEC for interpretations of, amb of ambiguities in campaign finance laws. In fact, both parties and their campaign committees now recognize that issue ads are legal. Press accounts indicate that both parties are rushing to raise huge sums of soft money to run issue ads this fall. Is that correct, Mr. Raddick? Well, yes, sir. I believe that's based upon uh, a decision by the Federal Election Commission on this issue. That is the board, not the auditors. Uh, let me say with respect to the independent counsel decision, there was extensive factual uh, investigation conducted during the preliminary investigation and that had to do with whether or not the president, the vice president or the heads of the parties, particularly the Democratic Party, had received um, advice of counsel uh, consistent with, uh, what, with the, uh, the state of the law and uh, whether that uh, advice of counsel would fit a defense and whether it was legitimate. Much of this discussion today and much of the work of our committee for quite some time has really hinged on whether one gives singularly malign interpretations to certain events or appearance of certain events, or whether one takes a, a somewhat more benign view. Uh, I want to go back to the, the early discussion uh, we had uh, with respect to Mr. Esposito's uh, recollection of your statement at the meeting you don't recall attending, that you were under a great deal of pressure. Uh, this is a statement that I suspect many people in public life can make, particularly during difficult and tension-filled periods. So I don't see anything remarkable. But I would like to deal with the issue of the alleged statement that the Attorney General's job hangs in the balance. I recall that there was a great deal of criticism of the Attorney General at the time, uh, and her job was in fact hanging in the balance. And I, I wonder if, Mr. Esposito, you could explain to me in plain English how you combine these, these, these two realities into a factual statement that on the face of it would be absurd. I mean, Mr. Radek obviously is an extremely intelligent person. And, um, and um, I, I agree with him and his conclusion that he could never make such a statement because this statement would be so palpably absurd and idiotic and counterproductive and embarrassing and stupid. And I have a difficulty seeing your rationale in taking statements from an individual and connecting them in a way which are so self-condemnatory. So can you enlighten me a bit on that subject? Sure. Uh, I'm not trying to make any conclusions or anything. I'm just well, you have repeat. already. I'm not and what, I, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get at, please understand what I'm saying. I stated earlier that there is little doubt in my mind that all three of you, to the best of your recollections, are telling the truth. There is not the slightest doubt in my mind that Mr. Radek is telling the truth. There is no doubt in my mind that the two of you, to the best of your ability, are telling the truth. But there is a fundamental flaw in your position. And that fundamental flaw in your position is that the statement you alleged was made would be an unbelievably idiotic, damaging, destructive, horrendously inappropriate statement, which an individual with Mr. Raddock's uh, uh, extraordinary public service of 30 years and with his legal background soberly would never make. How do you explain this? I can't explain it. Only well, thing is I can it say, conceivable? Wait, let me if you ask me a question, can I answer it? You may. 
I can't explain it. All I can tell you is this was the statement that was made. Why he made it, you'll have to ask him. But he can't recall. But I'm not, I'm, I'm telling you, that is the statement that was made. I didn't put two facts together. I haven't drawn any conclusions. I'm just repeating what the statement that I heard. You remember it verbatim. All I remember verbatim is that the Attorney General's job could hang in the balance. Well, it was hanging in the balance. There's no question about it. That was a statement of fact. But you connect these two, two items. The and pressure what, what that Mr. Items? Radek is under and the Attorney General job, which was obviously up it for said, grabs. When it said in the same statement, the same sentence, how could you not connect it? Well, uh, it's perfectly obvious that two statements can be made consecutively without a connection being made between the two of them as to causality. That should be obvious to you, Mr. Esposito. You created the causality, it seems to me, because I can't conceive of Mr. Radek, whom I haven't met until this afternoon, would be making such a statement, okay. just as it would not be plausible for me to have you make idiotic statements or Mr. Gallagher make idiotic statements. If you make an idiotic statement and if you are sober, maybe you misunderstood the statement. Is that a conceivable option? I... Is it conceivable to you that you misunderstood the statement? That you put two things together which really didn't belong together? What I heard was, we were he was talking about there was pressure, pressure on him, and in my fact, the Attorney General's job could hang in the balance. That came out of the same, within the, within the same two seconds. Well, try to reconstruct verbatim what the statement was. Because logic, you well, fly in the face of logic in connecting these two statements. Both of them could well have been made utterly innocently and utterly innocuously. Mr. Lantos, may I respond to that? Well, I'd like first, Mr. Esposito, I and think then that, I'll give I you think, a chance. I think you're, you're correct. It is a totally inappropriate statement, and that's why I remember it. And that's why I reported it 30 minutes later to the director of the FBI. But if it was such a totally inappropriate statement in your judgment, why didn't you probe at that point? My comment to, it was, nobody's asked me this yet at this hearing, but it was at the end of the meeting. In fact, I remember I was already standing out of my chair. I think Lee was in the process of rising out of his chair when he made his statement. And I, I think my response was something to the effect that I'm sure you'll do the right thing, Lee. That was it. And then he and Joe left the, uh, my office. Does it make sense to you that if, in fact, what you say hypothetically is true, that Mr. Radek would confide in you that the Attorney General is worried about her job? He didn't say that the Attorney General was worried about a job. Well, if your job is hanging in the balance, you presumably are worried about retaining your job, don't you? I'm not going to presume anything. Well, you, presume, think... you presumed something very big. You connected two conceivably plausible statements in a causal sequence, which, according to your own admission, makes no sense. No, I, I was agreeing with you that you're right. The, I'm not, I never said it didn't make any sense. I said it was inappropriate. Inappropriate. Well, have you heard him make many other such weighty, inappropriate statements? No. no. Was this out of character? Yes. Doesn't that give you pause that perhaps you misunderstood? No, I think this was a time at the beginning of a very important investigation. And uh, there was a lot of stress and pressure on the public integrity section, as there will be it was on the Bureau, to move forward in this investigation. Mr. Gallagher. There are two points. One, whether or not the meeting occurred. 
Uh, I had not seen the calendar or was unaware of a calendar entry by Mr. Esposito when I testified last week. Uh, I spoke from my recollection and I was in the adjoining office. Mr. Esposito asked me to join him in a meeting and that's what I testified to. With respect to May I stop you there for a moment? I'll give you plenty of time to okay. go on. Thank you, sir. There is not the slightest doubt in your mind, in my mind, that the two of you recall a meeting that took place. There is not the slightest doubt in my mind that Mr. Radek doesn't recall that meeting. I have scores of meetings with colleagues and constituents, not all of which I recall. And, and I have absolutely no difficulty accepting the fact that Mr. Gallagher and Mr. Esposito, you are accurately reflecting the fact that there was a meeting. And Mr. Radek accurately reflects his memory that he doesn't recall that meeting. I have no trouble with that. Where I have trouble, having listened to him now for a couple of hours, is accepting your characterization of his alleged statements, which would be disloyal to the Attorney General, to whom he is very loyal, and it would be just on the face of it so blatantly stupid that I am convinced he would never make it. And you too, you just stated, Mr. Esposito, that it was very out of character, that it didn't make sense. It didn't reflect the pattern of thoughtful, proper, intelligent, logical dialogue you had with this gentleman. Now, if I would be in your boots, I would say one of the possibilities is that I misconstrued the remarks. Mr. Lantos, if I could to Please. that point. I, after the meeting concluded, Mr. Esposito and I did not speak particularly about this statement. What we talked about was the strategy that the FBI would begin to put together to create the task force. I was unaware of the fact that he was going to go down the hall and talk to the director. Yes. I was unaware of the fact that the director was going to make a decision to talk to the attorney general about it and document his observations and the fact that he talked to the attorney general in a memorandum. Uh, it was not until some days after this memorandum was prepared that I had an opportunity to see it. Yes. Uh, the me memorandum as to the statement attributed to Lee Reddick is accurate. Uh, he did make the statement. I cannot interpret why he made the statement. I, I respect Lee Reddick. He's a friend. I respect him as an attorney. We've had a lot of professional contacts. I walked away from that statement with the appreciation that what he was saying was that this was going to be a very tough, critical investigation, and it was a statement of fact that the Attorney General's job may be on the line. Uh, 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 maybe, maybe hang in the balance is, is the way it said. When I saw it, I had no difficulty but, uh, with the accuracy of the statement and didn't know it was being documented. Yeah, but of course, you see, the Attorney General's job being in the balance and being on the line was obvious to anybody who listened and watched the Sunday morning mm -hmm. television programs. I mean, there was Republican senator after Republican senator calling for a resignation. There, there was unbelievable pressure in this body to, to uh, get rid of her. I mean, this was a statement of fact. Correct. And it was a well, well, what, what is so sinister about it if you don't connect the two? Well, the difficulty that I have is that you're asking me to analyze a statement that I did not make, nor did Bill Esposito make. It was made by Lee Reddick in our presence. We only reported what he said, and I can't get into what's behind it. And unfortunately, he doesn't recall either the meeting or the statement. So the difficulty is to analyze a statement that we don't have the person who made it 
recalling it. So, but, but we can still analyze the statement, Mr. Gallagher, whether, whether he recalls it or not, and I have no difficulty analyzing it in a benign fashion. I think both statements are accurate. He was under great pressure, period. The Attorney General's job was in the balance. Well, it was. Unfortunately, it was, was said there wasn't a period in between them. It, they were connected. Well, how do you, in an oral conversation, know where the periods and the semicolons are? Explain it, that it to me. It was one simple statement. It was not separated by any pause. It was not separated by other statements. It was connected. How the, was it connected? It was one statement. But, uh, say it, the it sentence. La it, it lasted a number of seconds. It was not a, I did not take it to be a dramatic statement. I, I share your opinion that there were a lot of publicity to the fact that the Attorney General's job may be hanging the balance. There was a lot of discussion of that. I, I recall the statement by Mr. Reddick about the pressure and the way that he said it, that there was pressure on him because the Attorney General's job may hang in the balance, uh, was said. That's not a direct quote, but is very close to that. But, you but see I that? took away from that that what he was attempting to convey or the, the implications that I took, and they may differ f from what the director of the FBI, how he reacted to it, but the implication that I took that Lee Reddick was making a statement of how sensitive and tough this investigation was going to be that we're about ready to enter. The whole purpose of this meeting, and it was an extraordinary meeting because it was the only meeting that I recall in Bill, es Bill Esposito's office with Lee Reddick and myself talking about campaign financing and the structure of the investigation that was to begin. That's why I recall the meeting, and that's why I recall the statement. Well, let me ask you whether my benign interpretation of the two sentences, which for the sake of the argument, I accept. What's wrong with my benign interpretation? Obviously, there was a great deal of pressure because they were beginning a major investigation. And obviously, the Attorney General's job was in the balance. Everybody knew that. The New York Times, the Washington Post had headlines, editorials, on a weekly basis on this subject. The difficulty I have is to hypothetically separate them when I, as one of the two people who heard it said, uh, did not hear or understand any separation from the two points. They were connected in as I heard them. Well, and if you connect it, what does it mean to you? What it means to me, what I took from that statement as I heard it, that Lee Reddick and I, don't, I didn't take it so much out of character with him because Lee Reddick was emphasizing that this was going to be a very difficult, sensitive investigation. That's the impression I took from it. Well, and, that's obvious. And, and so I did not overreact to it. I did not put any great significance on it. I did not know once Bill Esposito would discuss it with the director. It would become an issue that would be raised to the Attorney General. But Maybe that's my naiveness. No, it. it's not your naivete, because your interpretation, Mr. Gallagher, is exactly my interpretation. You have just, you have just substantiated the case I am making. You heard these two statements. You didn't think they were so extraordinary. You didn't run and write a memo about it. You didn't go to the head of the FBI to report it. You just thought, yeah, that's right. It's a very sensitive investigation, great pressure. The Attorney General's job is in the balance. But All the, those statements are true. But the issue is that the director of the FBI did read a higher degree of sensitivity into it. But that's and, your and job. That's what the FBI is. We, we want you guys to sniff for something in, in every conceivable context. But I don't blame Louis Free, and I don't blame Mr. Esposito. I am merely putting a more rational interpretation on some obvious statements. Mr. Raddock, as the Justice Department, was under a great deal of pressure, and the Attorney General's job was, in fact, in the balance. But they were connected. How were, well, of course they were connected. 
I mean, if she was in the, in the flower growing business, then the pressure would be less severe. We all understand that. The difficulty that you and I would have is attempting to interpret a statement made by someone else. It's, well, that was statement. my point to Mr. Esposito. Uh, you know, I would, um, I would, um, uh, 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 I would like to sort of go back to to an earlier dialogue we had. Let's put the statement or statements aside for a moment, although I would like to state for the record that not only do I think that a benign interpretation can be made of the alleged statements, but the only rational interpretation of the alleged statements is a benign interpretation. Um, do either of you believe that the Attorney General, in fact, based her decisions on political considerations or because she was concerned about retaining her job, Mr. Esposito? Uh, not for a minute do I believe that she may, would make a decision to keep a job, just based on those factors, just to keep a job. Well, then how can you, a minute ago, consider this statement so evil as to run to the FBI director to report it? I never said it was evil. And you, you miss, uh, well, it would have been evil. I mean, if, if, if my, she, my, she uh, would make her decision for the purpose of keeping her job, that is unacceptable, isn't it? First of all, I did not run down to the director's office, but immediately after the meeting, after Mr. Gallagher and I had uh, a few minutes of discussions, I reported the results of the meeting main focus of the meeting was two points, which I already previously testified to. Also, in the context of the discussion, this came up. That was my job, to brief the director on the results of the meeting, because the director and I had discussed having the meeting to begin with. Now, you asked me a question about the Attorney General. I answered the question, Attorney General. I, I have a great deal of respect for the Attorney General. I have a great deal of respect for her integrity. And I also think she would do the right thing. And if she do the right thing would cost her a job, she'd still do it. I appreciate that. Mr. Gallagher, what's your answer to that same question? I have the highest respect for the Attorney General. I've dealt with her on many issues, and I have no reason to, to question her at all. Well, let me say I share the highest respect you have for the Attorney General, and I have very high respect for all three of you. I only wish I would be as sure of anything as you are sh apparently sure of everything, Mr. Esposito, because I, I, I am never sure that I hear you right, or I hear my wife right, or I hear my friend right. Different people may have different interpretations of the same sentences, and it's rather important to, to sort of give a professional colleague the benefit of the doubt. I, um, I yield back to my time, Mr. Chairman. We were going to go ahead and give you the remainder of your five minutes since I had taken five minutes, so you have another two and a half, three minutes if you like. Do you have any more questions? Okay, the gentleman yields back the balance of time. Mr. Shays, uh, are you next? Thank you, yes, sir. I feel like I'm walking in a cesspool and someone's saying, drink the water, it's clean. Um, that's the way I felt for a number of years. And I can't reconcile a lot of things. I can't reconcile the public confidence in the Attorney General and the private memos that say something very different. Um, there are a lot of things that strike me as silly there are a lot of things that strike me as absurd, and there's a lot of things that strike me as downright dangerous. I can't reconcile, Mr. Reddick, you're telling me that you just didn't really get involved in the vice president or the president after September 1997 when you wrote a memo in November 98 talking about the independent counsel and why the president shouldn't be, and the vice president, excuse me, why the vice president shouldn't have an independent counsel as if somehow you weren't involved. I can't reconcile that. I can't reconcile a memo 
that is clear as clear can be. And I'm going to read part of it. And it's the memo that came out by Mr. Free to you, Mr. Esposito. I mean, I knew about the Free Memo to Reno in November 97, and I knew about the Labello Memo in 98, in July of 98, both recommending independent counsels. So I mean, we may love the Attorney General, but it was very clear. There was no doubt in either person's mind that an Attorney General should appoint an independent counsel based on just the law requiring it and based on even if she, the law didn't require it, just her discretion. I can't, I can't reconcile that she didn't, but, you know, that's her opinion, and she took her position. But I didn't know about the free amendment to you, Mr. Esposito. I didn't know there was a memo that said, as I related to you this morning, I met with the Attorney General on Friday, December 6, 1996, to discuss the above-mentioned, ca uh, ca the above-captioned matter, and it's entitled Democrat National Campaign Matter. I stated that the DOJ had not yet referred the matter to the FBI to conduct a full criminal investigation. It was my recommendation that this referral take place as soon as possible. It blows my mind the FBI wasn't given this referral. Then, then he continues to say to you, Mr. Esposito, I also told the Attorney General that since she had declined to refer the matter to the independent counsel, it was my recommendation that she select a first-rate DOJ legal team from outside Maine Justice to conduct the inquiry. In fact, I said that these uh, prosecutors should be junkyard dogs and that, in my view, PIS was not capable of conducting the thorough, aggressive kind of investigation which was required. Not a very good recommendation of you, Mr. Reddick. I also advised the Attorney General of Lee Raddick's comments to you that there was a lot of pressure on him and PIS regarding this case because the Attorney General's job might hang in the balance, or words to that effect. I stated that th those comments would be enough for me to take him and the criminal division off the case completely. I also stated that it didn't make much sense for PIS to call the FBI the lead agency in this matter while operating a task force with with the Department of Commerce IGs who were conducting interviews of key witnesses without the knowledge or participation of the FBI. I strongly recommended that the FBI and hand-picked DOJ attorneys from outside Maine Justice run this case as we would in any matter of such importance and complexity. And believe me, it goes on. I intended to repeat my recommendation from Friday's meeting. He goes on. I want to know, Mr. Raddick, if you were told the moment after he met, Mr. Free met with the Attorney General, that you had according to Mr. Free, made comments that questioned your ability to do your job. I'm sorry, what's the question? Did I know that? Did, did the Attorney General, who you all seem to be in awe of, come to you and tell you that this comment had been made? No. I was unaware the comment was made until I saw this memo. So the Attorney month. General, after she was confronted by the director of the FBI, that your integrity was in question. And would you agree that this raises questions about your integrity? Whether, Under, whether uh, or not you think you made that statement, don't you think this raises questions about your integrity? It seems to me that the director uh, is drawing a, an inference that questions my integrity, yes, sir. Mr. Esposito, I am happy that you spoke to the FBI director. You did what you should do. And you're not happy that you're here today. And you are all people who work with each other, and I know that. But you heard it. You were obligated to step forward, and you spoke to your director. He was obligated to speak to the attorney general. Would someone here tell me why the attorney general didn't tell you, Mr. Raddick, about this memo? Obviously, you can't, can you? No, I can't. Can you tell me, Mr. Esposito? No, I can't. Can you, Mr. Gallagher? Sir. Well, then how the heck can any of you gentlemen tell me you have confidence in their investigation. It doesn't make sense to me. It is not logical to me. It's not, it, how can you praise her when you have, she has been confronted with a question of integrity and she doesn't even go to the individual who was in fact accused of making the statement. Let me ask you a question, Mr. Esposito. 
If your integrity was questioned, and you are the deputy director of the FBI, correct? Correct. If your integrity was questioned and someone went to your director, Mr. Free, and you were accused of making statements that made it seem like you could not carry out your job, would you expect Mr. Free to come to you and confront you? Yes, I would. Well, I'll just say for the record, my time has run out. It doesn't make sense to me why the Attorney General, who you all praise with her integrity and that she's doing a great job, didn't do a great job in this instance. And it raises gigant gigantic questions to this member of Congress about what the hell was going on at DOJ. Gentleman yields back his time as this time has expired, Mr. Barr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, sometimes at these hearings, when I uh, listen to uh, Mr. Waxman, or in this case, Mr. Lantos, uh, questioning administration witnesses, uh, they're, they're, they're operating in a, in a, a different dimension. Uh, sometimes, uh, I don't know whether you remember, Mr. Chairman, the bizarro world. Uh, the bizarro world of Superman, which was another dimension into which he would occasionally uh, traverse, uh, everything was the opposite. Uh, up was down, left was right, uh, clean was dirty, dirty was clean, uh, everything was all jumbled together. And uh, Mr. Lantos' statements, apparently, to which Mr. Radick subscribes also, that it's perfectly normal uh, and acceptable and understandable for statements to be made that an attorney general's job is in the balance if he or she follows the law and recommends the appointment of an independent counsel may be entirely acceptable in the Clinton bizarro world, but it is not acceptable in the world of prior administrations, Republican and Democrat, and it is not acceptable, Mr. Chairman, in the world of the majority on this committee, and that is why you have convened these hearings and why the other side would never dream of convening these hearings. Because in their world, for an attorney general uh, to be confronted with statements by the head of the public integrity section uh, that uh, raise the question about her integrity and her job being in the balance simply if she happens to follow the law or recommend the, and recommend the appointment of, a, of an independent counsel would in fact be subject to great questioning because that would not be acceptable in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it's just absolutely mind-boggling that these, uh, this, this witness uh, and Mr. Lantos can be sitting here bantering back and forth that this is perfectly understandable. Uh, it is perfectly understandable only in the context of the administration in which the, the evidence is offered. Uh, contrast, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the lethargy uh, with which the public integrity section uh, approached uh, the campaign uh, financing uh, matters here uh, with the way they tried to come after the head of the FBI. Uh, on uh, March 5th of 1997, just short, relatively shortly after, the director's memo of December 1996. Apparently, the director made uh, a mistake in testimony uh, before the Congress on a completely unrelated matter. Uh, and immediately, uh, the, uh, the Department of Justice, the Clinton Department of Justice, launched into action uh, and immediately felt the need to trigger a preliminary investigation, even though it was an inadvertent mischaracterization in the director of the FBI's testimony uh, which he immediately, when he, when he realized it was inaccurate, corrected the record, uh, yet the Department of Justice uh, immediately launches a preliminary investigation uh, into, uh, into that matter. Uh, now, they concluded relatively quickly that there were no grounds to continue with the appointment of an independent counsel, uh, but in that case, they certainly had no hesitancy at all that the uh, minimum threshold necessary to begin a preliminary in inquiry uh, was met. Uh, whether or not that was an effort, uh, another effort to get back the uh, head of the FBI for standing for the rule of law and demanding that the law be upheld, I don't know. We'll probably never know. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, Mr. Chairman, that even though, uh, as we saw earlier in Mr. Lantos's uh, uh, continuous efforts to, you know, make sure there's plenty of sunshine out there and everybody is, uh, is lovey-dovey with everybody else. Uh, he played uh, testimony from uh, Director Free of about three years or so ago. At that time, 
we did not have, Mr. Chairman, the memos that we now have before us. As you indicated at the beginning of these hearings, it's taken you about two and a half years to get these memos, even though they've been under subpoena for quite some time. At the time that Mr. Freed testified back then, which we heard the brief snippet of today, we did not have those. And at that hearing, the chairman will recall, and I presume these witnesses will recall, that Mr. Free had to be very circumspect about how he discussed these matters and how he answered questions regarding them because the memos had not been made public and we did not have them. However, at the time, in response to questioning by uh, myself, uh, he said that his recommendation was based on more than one uh, aspect of the statute uh, regarding appointment of independent counsels. Uh, I asked him at the time uh, uh, if he was aware of the fact, of course, that there were only two bases on which an independent counsel uh, could be triggered. One was conflict of interest, and the other was uh, credible evidence that uh, covered persons, including the president and vice president, might have violated federal laws. In response to that, he answered yes. We now know, based on the memos that are before this panel today uh, and before these witnesses today, that uh, the director went into quite some detail uh, criticizing the manner in which Mr. Radick's office uh, presupposed that uh, the covered persons were telling the truth. They gave them every inference uh, of every ben the benefit of every inference that what they were saying in their self-serving statements were true and correct. Uh, and therefore, contrary, and the director says this, contrary uh, to the way a normal investigation progresses in which at the, uh, right off the bat you don't give the potential defendants or those that are the subject of, of uh, an investigation the benefit of every doubt, you in fact uh, ask relatively probing questions, uh, you are, remain somewhat skeptical uh, that in the case at hand, uh, the quite the opposite was done, and therein lies the essence of the director's uh, disagreements with the way the uh, uh, public integrity section was handling this investigation. Now, you have not gone into this, Mr. Chairman, but I think it's also relevant uh, to have a little bit of history in this area with regard to uh, why Mr. Radick uh, may have been uh, doing so much to ensure that the FBI was cut out of this. Uh, the fact of the matter is that with regard to a previous uh, uh, matter of the appointment of an, of an independent counsel regarding Henry Cisneros, the FBI there also had recommended that based on uh, credible evidence, uh, an independent counsel needed to be applied for. The Department of Justice resisted that effort. It was only when the director of the FBI insisted over the objections of uh, the public integrity section uh, that uh, the attorney general moved forward with uh, the seeking of the appointment of an independent counsel. And I think that was perhaps more than anything else that something that gave rise to the bad blood here uh, and why uh, the uh, Office of Pub the Public Integrity section uh, resisted so substantially uh, the uh, efforts by the head of the FBI to see that the uh, independent counsel law uh, was enforced, uh, as well as the efforts by uh, Mr. Labella. So uh, at least on this side of the aisle, Mr. Chairman, I don't want there to be any, uh, any, any presumption that, that we agree that it is perfectly normal and healthy uh, for uh, some statement to be made uh, that the Attorney General uh, was under a lot of pressure and her job might hang in the balance uh, uh, if, in fact, an independent counsel uh, is appointed. That is entirely unacceptable. That has never happened, as far as we know, in any prior administration, Republican or Democrat, faced with similar allegations, even those in the Carter administration before uh, the independent counsel statute, uh, per se, came into existence. Uh, and that's why, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate very much your holding these hearings uh, so that we can uh, at least set the record straight. Uh, today, which we were not able to do because we didn't have these documents available at the last time the director of the FBI uh, testified on these matters. Thank you, uh, Mr. Barr. Let, I, I guess we're about to conclude the hearing. Do we have, you have some more questions? Uh, well, l let me get back to you in just a second then. On November the 1st, 1996, uh, Mr. Radick, you wrote a letter to uh, Mr. Stephen Zipperstein, Chief Assistant United States Attorney in California for the Central District. And you says that this is to confirm the substance of the conversation on October 31st, 1996 among Assistant U.S. Attorney Steve Mansfield, you and myself, concerning two matters potentially venued within your district. And it involved the, 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 the Shilai Temple, and it involved another issue 
and you directed them not to continue their investigation, even though they were sending out subpoenas and try, ready to go after maybe possibly in, in, in paneling a grand jury. And you said that uh, the reason was uh, the public integrity section, which is responsible for all potential independent counsel matters, has been assigned to examine all of the allegations to determine whether further investigation is warranted and whether appointment of an independent counsel might be appropriate, as would be necessary in any matter with potential independent counsel ramifications, your office should take no steps to investigate these matters at this time. So you stopped him from conducting the investigation. And you said, in addition, we would appreciate it if you would immediately provide us with any background or other information you may have gathered today concerning either of these matters. Well, the end result was you didn't appoint an independent counsel. I'm not sure you probably ever had any in, uh, had uh, any desire or inclination to do that, but for some reason you did want to take it out of the hands of the U.S. attorney out there who was really hell-bent for leather to pursue that. And uh, as a result, uh, I don't know that anything was ever done with that. So that, along with everything else we've been reading in these memos, would lead one to believe that there is an attempt by the Justice Department and the Public Integrity Section not to go after people who are connected with this White House. And that's what Mr. LaBella's memo said, in effect. I, I, I don't know. I hope everybody reads the LaBella memo. All this stuff today, if you watch this whole hearing, I'm sure people's going to say, my gosh, it looks like somebody making sausage. How do you understand all the ramifications of this? But the fact of the matter is there has been no thorough investigation of Mr. Ickes, the president, the vice president. They weren't even asked questions uh, about uh, illegal campaign activities. They weren't even asked questions about people they were connected with. And it, it was apparent, apparently intentional. Now, you know, that bothers us a great deal. And that's why we have been so aggressive in investigating this and why uh, we have been diligent. And the Justice Department for two and a half to three years has kept us from getting documents, which we finally got because I was going to bring the chief lieutenant uh, for, uh, you know, Eric Holder before the committee with the documents. And if he didn't bring them, I was going to hold him in contempt of Congress. I was going to take it to the floor. And I think they knew that. And so they finally coughed up the documents after two and a half years. You know, and then you look at this, this, these memos here. This is the memorandum to Mr. Esposito from uh, Mr. Free. It was unfortunate that DOGA declined to allow the FBI to play any role in the independent counsel referral deliberations. I agree with you that based on the DOJ's experience with the Cisneros matter, which was only referred to the independent counsel because the FBI and I intervened directly with the Attorney General, it was decided to exclude us from this decision-making process. Keep them out of there. I admire all your loyalty. I really do. Saying that you believe that the Attorney General and the people over justice would not uh, do this, and I think publicly that's probably as it should be. Louis Free and you fellas are are loyal, but when you read the memos, you see either gross incompetence over there or deliberately blocking a thorough investigation of the White House and all these other things that have been going on over there. And while I admire your, your loyalty and, and your public position, when you read these private memos, it sure paints a different story. Now I'm going to sum up and then I'm going to let uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, who do we have now? Mr. Shays go next. Free, Labello, and DeSarno sat right where you folks are sitting, and they said there should be an independent counsel. The memos, I believe, speak for themselves. I think when you read the memo from Louis Free, and I spent hours reading it, and I spent hours reading Mr. Labella's memo, I think they speak for themselves. The problem is making sure that the American people understand how strongly both Louis Free and the FBI and Mr. Labella felt about this. One of his subordinates felt so strongly he resigned. Mr. Labella's subordinates resigned because he said it was such a, such a biased mess. Mr. Radick, like three former counsels to the president who sat right there on the email thing just a few weeks ago, 
and several other people going all the way back to the uh, FBI scandal when they were taking uh, uh, FBI uh, reports, uh, Mr. Livingstone and Mr. Marcisa, and uh, even the travel office investigation, the memory loss, the inability of anybody to remember anything just makes me want to vomit. You can't be indicted for perjury if you don't remember. And so what happens when we have... <laughs> Who was the chief counsel that was here? Uh, yeah, Chuck Ruff. Chuck Ruff said when he was investigating the Whitewater investigation, he said, if I'm ever in this position, and I paraphrase him, he says the best thing to do is to say you don't remember. And Mr. Ruff didn't remember. Neither did his subordinate. Neither did the, pre the, the, the new uh, counsel, Ms. Nolan. None of them remembered anything. And now today... Mr. Radick doesn't remember. He just doesn't remember a meeting that's that significant when they're talking about one of the most important cases in the history of the United States. He doesn't remember the pressure statement. He doesn't remember saying, you know, that uh, the attorney general's job hangs in the balance. That's pretty strong stuff. I don't know how you forget that. They didn't forget it. Louis Free didn't forget it. He went to the attorney general and talked to her about it, but she doesn't remember it either. The epidemic from the White House has spread to the Attorney General. And now to you, Mr. Radick. It's just amazing. And the thing that bothers me the most is that if the Attorney General, and I say if, if the Attorney General's job and her position was so important that she did not appoint an independent counsel in accordance with the law that was passed by Congress, if she deliberately did not appoint an independent counsel because she wanted to keep her job or she wanted to protect the president and not have a thorough investigation, that is obstruction of justice. That is a felony. That's obstruction of justice if that's what she did. I'm not sure we're ever going to find out, but by golly, after reading all this stuff and going through this for two and a half, three years, I'm convinced that's what they did. And you too, Mr. Rady. And finally, uh, Louis Free, as I said, as well as you gentlemen, publicly support the Attorney General. But all of the evidence and the information that we have here shows just the opposite. And I think it's a tragic shame and it's a black stain and a blot on the justice of the United States of America and the Justice Department. Mr. Shays. I'm not going to keep you here much longer. I just uh, want to resolve in my mind, uh, Mr. Riotti, I'm, excuse me, Mr. Radek. Is it Radek or Radek? It's Radek, Mr. Shays. Thank you. I, I heard Mr. Lanto say Radek, and I, he's usually right on the mark, so it made me wonder. Mr. Radek, um, I'm interested to know under what basis you uh, make the statement that the uh, temple, Buddhist temple fundraiser was not meant to be a fundraiser but an outreach. You, you made reference to that. I, I don't know that I ever adopted that position. If there is a document where I did, I'd be I glad thought to you, examine I thought you made reference to the fact that no. the... Okay. No, I, I think that was the, the vice president's uh, interview. He, he probably said something to that no, I, I was. I, I heard the temple, and I didn't think it was Mr. Esposito. No, I said that the Shilai temple was one part of the campaign financing investigation. Right, and you did not feel... Um, uh, what, what interests me is that Mr. Tree suggested it, Mr. Wong arranged for it, and Mr. Shaw, excuse me, Marie Shaw carried it out. Right. Tell me what was illegal about that event. Well, there were uh, uh, several uh, offenses committed, but the focus of the investigation was, as you suggest, whether there was a conspiracy among uh, what the FBI like to call the opportunists, the people who were uh, the fundraisers who were uh, uh, going out and raising money and, and uh, presumably trying to get favors in return for that, um, to raise foreign contributions, to raise uh, contributions that were uh, uh, what we call straw man contributions, that is contributions made in the name of another. Well, that's laundered and, money. Well, it is. Uh, I'm not sure it technically fits the money laundering statute, but I'd rather reserve a legal opinion on that since we may be uh, trying to use that. It, it may well be money laundering. 
um, and, uh, and, and there's a lot of crimes that may flow from that, like false statements to the FEC, interference with the FEC or some other federal uh, uh, function, and that, that, that's all that was uh, that the type of charges that were brought against from Maria Shaw for which she was convicted. So it's, it was illegal, though, clearly illegal. There was illegal activity involved in that fundraiser in terms of foreign and um, straw man contributions. Yes. Right, which I call honored money, and you don't. It was it was money uh, supposedly given by individuals, and it wasn't their money. It, it was laundering money to uh, cover up who actually was giving the money. Yes, there's a specific FEC crime, FECA crime, that's contributing in the name of another that violated it. I, it that may, was, that it was may or may not violate the money laundering statute. Okay, That's my that, only question. But it was under FEC, and you seem to carry a lot of weight what the FEC says. Uh, uh, the, the act, the FECA, the, the, the Federal Election Campaign But it was act. illegal. Yes. And the president was involved in it. I don't know. The vice the, president was involved in it. The vice president appeared there, yes. Well, and, he, was and, the, he was the attraction. Yes. That was the why people came. Yes. Okay. Where, where are we going with this? Where, where we're going with it is just, I'm just trying to understand your logic. Because you recommended in 98 not to move forward, and yet you are telling me that you didn't get involved in this investigation after 97 when I asked you specifically about whether the vice president was questioned, and you kind of waved it off like I wasn't involved. You, meaning. Well, the 97 interview of the vice president I took part in. I know what was asked at that interview. So I could answer your question. No, but what the, the, the subsequent interviews I was not involved in, but when they involved the independent counsel issues, obviously, I became aware of the contents of the interview. That doesn't mean to say that I know whether or not in the course of that interview, someone may have asked a question about the Shilai Temple. That's all I'm saying. I wasn't but, involved but, in the but, interviews. But I wasn't involved in the process. Me, what bothers me is that you wouldn't know. Because you wrote a memo, memo 35 in our uh, uh, exhibit, and the title is to recommend that the attorney general not trigger a preliminary investigation in this matter. But this has nothing to do with the uh, Shilai Temple, I believe. But it has with the phone calls. Yes, which had nothing to do with the Shilai Temple. Right. The Shilai Temple is, was a separate and what I want to know particular is, part of campaign finance right. investigation. And what I want to know is, why you didn't speak to that issue. The issue of whether the vice president spoke at a fundraiser where illegalities were committed, uh, it, it wasn't a terribly relevant issue. The issue you will find addressed in the attorney general's letter um, in uh, late 96, I think it was, to, me, to the Congress. Let me understand. Maybe, maybe you're dead right and I'm just foolish to, to wonder, but if I'm involved in a fundraising event that is raising illegal money, somehow I don't have to, you, 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 you kind of dismiss it like, you know, you foolish person. How, of course we wouldn't look at that. No, no, sir, we looked at it thoroughly and eventually Maria Shaw was indicted for that. Right. And of course we looked at anybody who was involved. We never came across any specific incredible evidence that the vice president was involved in the illegality. And I wanted to know if you asked him the questions. I did not ask him the questions when we interviewed him in 1967. And why didn't you see if they was asked in 1997 and 1998? Well, I was if no you're in charge of public integrity. I was no longer involved in that, but the processes were there that if, I don't understand if that. the allegation aro I, I arose... I honestly don't understand what you just said to me. You were not involved in what? I was not involved in the task force's work to the extent that they were still investigating the Shilai yeah, Temple. The gentleman from so Connecticut will have five additional minutes without objection. I, I just want to understand, if you're in charge of public integrity, it's my sense we either have an independent counsel who looks at the integrity of our public officials, or you do. Now, in this instance, now there are a lot of other people who looks at them. Um, as uh, I, I don't as the acting chairman can tell you, most of the corruption work is done by United States attorneys. In this case, the task force, uh, after Mr. Labella's arrival, stopped being part of the public integrity section. It became a separate entity. To the extent that the investigation continued, I stayed on for a while in an advisory capacity, and as independent counsel matters would come up, I would be called in to, to do a preliminary investigation and to uh, give an, an, an opinion along with everybody else. 
I was no longer in charge of directing where the task force went or what it investigated. So Mr. LaBella does his investigation and he recommends that an independent counsel be appointed with no reservation whatsoever. At the end of his tenure, he wrote that report, which you're releasing today, which summarized, was, was intended to summarize all of his investigations, and he recommends an independent counsel for the, for various particular matters and sort of for the whole thing. Right, and you, I'm sure you read them, his memo. I did, and I responded to it, and I presume you're releasing my memo as well. Okay. And the director of the FBI recommended an independent counsel. And you, at every instance, recommended that there not be one. Not, so I'm not, just not exactly true, sir. There were some where I recommended an independent counsel. And, and what were the instances where you recommended independent counsel? Well, there were some that were appointed, and then there was uh, one where she disagreed with me, and that no, was Harold Dickey. I, I want you to be specific. Under what particular areas did you recommend an independent counsel? Um, on uh, Alexis Herman. No, is it related to the president or vice president? And is it related to campaign abuse? Alexis Herman, Harold Ickes. Any That's others? All. Okay, but not the vice president. No, sir. Not the president. That's correct. Did you write? Memo? Although I, I was deeply involved in the Monica Lewinsky thing, but not related to campaign finance. Did you write um, memos arguing that the president and the vice president should not have a special counsel? I did. Do we have all of those? I believe so. I, I'm not in charge of so, document production, but I'm so reasonably sure you do. You took an active interest in recommending that the president and the vice president not have an independent counsel look at campaign abuses, but you tell me that there are areas where you did not um, uh, question or areas where you were not involved. So I just, just reconcile it. But that's not to say that someone wasn't doing it. When I stopped being involved, the task force continued its work. And I'm quite confident uh, that, that the work was done well, uh, and I think the results will speak for it. Uh, they've had numerous convictions. The investigation continues, and it's it's a logical, well-structured investigation that I think is, uh, that I'm sure is ongoing now. What I'm saying is my personal involvement only involved the independent counsel decisions after some point when Mr. LaBella was there, because that's my job. If um, soft money was used by the president or his media people uh, and directed to certain states, and the president was in some way involved in writing those ads, do you consider that an illegal act? I do not. Why? Because the FEC hasn't said it's illegal, and in fact, the FEC has now said it's not illegal. Coordination, no matter how closely the president did it, it doesn't seem to be an issue at all. And the FEC has ruled that instead, the only thing that matters is the content of the ads. If the ads contain an electioneering message, then they need to be paid for it with hard money. Otherwise, it's soft money. So, it, it, well, we know it's soft money. I'm, well. I'm talking about what's permissible. The FEC has said it's okay for soft money to be used and directed by an individual uh, like the candidate and his media people? Yes, no matter how, how closely he coordinated it. It's irrelevant. And, and the basis for that is what decision of the FEC? The FEC decision, I believe, on the Common Cause case, but there's a number of opinions that lead up to it that told us that's where they were going. Well, I'll just conclude by saying um, the public statements are very laudable about people like the Attorney General. The memos that we have are just replete with statements questioning the veracity of the investigation by the FBI, by people who were in DOJ. And I don't know how to reconcile it. And I don't know how to reconcile the fact, Mr. Raddick, in particular, right, excuse me, I don't know how to reconcile the fact that there was a meeting that you don't remember, that two people here remember. I don't know how to reconcile the fact that they felt so concerned that they spoke to the director of the FBI, and the director of the FBI felt so concerned that he spoke to the attorney general. And then, 
as she says, I take full responsibility. But I don't know what taking full responsibility means anymore with this attorney general. Because she obviously didn't speak to you, according to your statements. And you certainly would have remembered that. So she just let it hang. And the statement you're accused of making is basically saying, in so many words, that you were concerned about what you did as it related to an independent counsel of the president or vice president because she may, in effect, not get reappointed. That was the gist of it. And I would think that if she was confronted with that, she would call you and say, what the heck are you making statements like that for? And then you could have said, I didn't make a statement. And then you could have gone back and, and set the record straight. But instead, she allows this to be a public record with no answer. I can't reconcile that either, Congressman. I can tell you that Bill Esposito and I were friends for a long time. Um, in fact, we had some very frank discussions at times about what was wrong with uh, the Department of Justice and or the FBI. Um, and the fact that he did not, that he was disturbed by this remark and did not ask me about it uh, is something I won't understand. And, and I haven't discussed it with him prior to this uh, testimony. I hope to discuss it with him sometime. Well, but you questioned but, him. But beyond that, um, let me say this. There, there's a couple of things in your question that sort of uh, aren't supported by the evidence. One is the decision on an independent counsel. Uh, I think if you look at the memorandum and listen to the, these two gentlemen's testimony, th what they say I said was the investigation. Now, whether or not that related to an independent counsel, I don't, uh, I don't read from this being uh, a part of the argument. Um, and I agree that there, there is a sinister interpretation to be taken from this memorandum. Mr. Gallagher, I believe, didn't walk away from that meeting with the Simpsons. It sounds to me like Mr. Esposito was puzzled, um, as I would have been if I had heard somebody like me make this remark, um, which to me, again, uh, uh, disappoints me that he didn't ask me about it at the time. And yet, there you go again. You don't, you don't have any interest in, in voicing the same concern about the Attorney General? Well, sir, I can say that, you know, the Attorney General wasn't bashful about uh, asking me uh, or uh, about uh, things that happened, and, and uh, I have no explanation as to why uh, she didn't ask this, but, um, you know, my, I, I would have to speculate that it somehow it got the, it did, it communicated to her in a manner less effectively than it stated but, but here. But that's the general way. The, the, the stronger way is to say that your integrity was questioned by the director of the FBI because of a statement you are believed to have made and you weren't confronted with that. That's the way I look at it. And it raises a gigantic question of what other things she didn't act on when she should have. I mean, the fact is we do know, we do know that Mr. Esposito felt this statement was made. We do know that Mr. Gallagher felt this statement was made. And Mr. Gallagher, would you, uh, say that you didn't think it was sinister you you just passed it off i heard you respond to mr lantos but i mean did you come to the same conclusion mr esposito did i came to the conclusion that first of all the statement was made and in a connected fashion but the impression i took at the time in the context of the discussion was that what lee reddick was conveying to us was the sensitivity of this investigation. Uh, that's what I took away from it. Did you think that, so you don't come to the same conclusion that Mr. Esposito came, that, that uh, uh, he was concerned that potentially how he made a decision on independent counsel might affect whether or not um, the Attorney General was um, gonna have her job? At the time, I did not come away with that reaction. And perhaps it's because what I was focused on was moving forward with the investigation. The purpose of this meeting that day was to get from Lee Reddick an appreciation of what the public integrity section had been done up to this point so the FBI could get some control of the investigation. We were seeing in the paper a lot of reports about events that would become the campaign financing but, you know, and we weren't asked to do anything yet. So the purpose of the meeting was to ask Lee Reddick to come over, discuss the investigation so we could get a plan together and move forward. So uh, based on your answer, and, and truth requires me to ask this question, your conclusion basically was not the same as Mr. Esposito's. I don't know that it's in conflict with Mr. Esposito. No, you can't have it both ways. It not be as Mr. strong Mr. as Mr. Gallagher, the you can't have it both ways. You either 
have to decide in your own mind if you thought Mr. Raddick was, Radick was in fact suggesting that his job was on the line or her job was on the line based on, on this, uh, his decision about an independent counsel, which is what Mr. Esposito felt and told the, uh, the uh, director of the FBI, or he didn't. And, and you can't say you agree with Mr. Esposito or not. You basically are suggesting otherwise. I am su suggesting that, well, I'm not suggesting, I'm stating that what I heard Lee Reddick say was that there was a lot of pressure on him because the attorney general's job might hang in the balance. I can't interpret what he meant by that statement. Well, you did interpret it. You did not interpret it as being, in fact, a suggestion that the attorney general might lose her job if he didn't make the right suggestion. Your statement went a little further than that. It, your statement, as I heard you just stated, was that you tied it to the, her decision on the independent counsel. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't recall Lee Radick making a statement that day in the context of the statement that tied the pressure, the attorney general's job, and independent counsel. So what's on the table, bottom line? is that, Mr. Esposito, you heard it a certain way and you reported it and no action was taken afterwards by the Attorney General as far as confronting Mr. Reddick with this and as far as resolving this. And uh, Mr. Esposito, let me ask you this question. Do you regret not asking Mr. Reddick to go in more detail about what he meant? Yeah, looking back on it, yes. Fair enough, thank you. Feel back. I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the GAO briefing report to the Chairman Committee on the Judiciary House of Representatives dated May 2000, entitled Campaign Finance Task Force Problems and Disagreements Initially Hampered Justice's Investigation be made part of the record without objection. So ordered. Uh, Mr. Radick, I think at uh, Exhibit 35 there is a fairly lengthy memo dated August 24, 1998. Uh, that you wrote to uh, Mr. Robinson, the Assistant Attorney General, Criminal Division. If you recall that memo. I do. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, a task force prosecutor the very next day uh, after reviewing your memo, took uh, exception to a number of the factual points that you made in there. Are you aware of that? I am. Uh, were those uh, disagreements followed up on? In other words, uh, where this prosecutor indicated that the uh, that the agents uh, disagreed with the characterization of their positions, uh, was that followed up on? I'm sure it was. I, 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 I can recall that some were specifically, but I'm sure that they all were. But did you follow up on it? Um, th there were follow-ups on um, uh, the vice president's credibility, on um, uh, the uh, Panetta um, uh, statements and, and things like that. So yes, we did. Well, your memo, uh, I believe, says that uh, it was Panetta's impression that the vice president uh, uh, was following the hard money discussions. Uh, and the agent's notes reflect that Panetta said the vice president was listening attentively. Uh, would that be important evidence showing intent? Yes. Uh, I, I, I don't see much difference between um, what what the, he said and what his impression was. And it, it seems to so me. You're your view is, as, a, as a, a prosecutor, that if you have additional witnesses that make statements indicating, and these are trained agents, uh, credible witnesses, I presume you would agree, uh, and they make statements uh, to the effect that uh, a key witness said that the vice president was listening attentively uh, with regard to questions over whether or not he was following discussions of hard money and soft money, that that would not be relevant? Oh, no, it's quite relevant, sir. I'm saying that there's not much difference between that and saying it was his impression that the vice president was paying attention. But neither one swayed you. 
Neither one swayed me. They were certainly evidence that I considered in making my recommendation. Okay, you considered it and did not follow it. Well, I didn't consider it to be determinative. I could certainly consider it. That, that's, that's certainly obvious. Uh, also, in, in, the, uh, in the memo, uh, you say that Gore stated that he and the president did not often attend DNC budget meetings like that held on November 21st. Uh, in fact, uh, the agents, I believe, reported that most witnesses indicated that the president and vice president did, in fact, attend the DNC budget meetings. Was that discrepancy between your memo and witnesses stating that the president and vice president, as a matter of course, attended the DNC meetings, going, of course, to the issue of whether or not they were aware of the hard money, soft money uh, uh, activities. Uh, was that followed up on the difference between your memo and what the agent said most witnesses uh, reported? I don't specifically recall, although I still believe at the end of this that I was and still I'm under the impression that they did not attend those meetings. Okay, despite, uh, uh, did you attend the meetings? No, sir. Uh, the witnesses uh, did and uh, uh, said that the president and the vice president did attend them, but that was not uh, persuasive to you either. There were witnesses and there were calendars and there was a lot of evidence as to which meetings they attended and which they didn't. My impression now is, as my best recollection is, uh, it was my conclusion that they did not attend many of them. Okay. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a whole range of issues, uh, as we've gone over today through questions uh, with uh, uh, the uh, majority council, there are, is a, a great deal of evidence uh, indicating uh, that uh, an independent counsel uh, should have been triggered. Uh, you know, these witnesses and the agent's testimony. Uh, what can you tell us as of today, uh, what is the status of the common cause investigation? I'm quite sure it's dead. Uh, the FEC's ruling that this is not an offense, I think, uh, controls and uh, and uh, stated what I thought was obvious from the beginning, that this was not a violation, it was a yeah, the, F the FEC is the controlling authority? Yes, sir. Really? Yes. Not the Department of Justice? No, I mean, we could prosecute it, but if the FEC uh, uh, said it wasn't a violation after we got a conviction, I think we'd have to, uh, in good conscience, dismiss are you, it. Are you aware of how few attorneys and investigators the FEC has? Oh, yes, sir, I am. And are you aware of how many the Department of Justice has in contraposition to that? Yes, sir. In fact, the FEC reached out to and the FBI you defer, for help. You, de you defer to the FEC? Well, sir, I don't defer to them. You did. I mean, I didn't pass the law that gave them the ability to interpret the statute. I uh, don't nobody, nobody on this committee has deferred to the FEC. What we're trying to get to the bottom of is, despite the fact that we have a number of FBI agents, we have a number of witnesses who are testifying uh, that lead them to the conclusion that the allegations contained in the Common Cause complaint were, in fact, meritorious and that an independent counsel should be uh, appointed, including the gentleman sitting behind you, Mr. Parkinson, the general counsel for the, uh, for the FBI. Uh, you're sitting there and you're saying, despite all of that, I'm going to defer to the FEC. Sir, if we're going to count heads on this issue, you know, the heads probably broke evenly, although I got to say, I think there were more people who agreed with me that there was not a violation. Isn't, isn't it's, it the it's job? It's not a matter it of a democracy. It, it is, it's a matter no, of... No, we're not talking reasoning. about democracy. You know, you're being silly, Mr. Radick. Well, exactly. What I'm saying is we have a number of trained FBI agents. Those aren't just heads. Those are trained FBI agents. We have a number of witnesses. We have the general counsel for the FBI. We have the head of the FBI. We have the special uh, appointed assistant U.S. attorney in charge of, of CAPCON or the campaign contribution scandal. We have other attorneys. We have Mr. Steve Clark, who felt so frustrated at his inability to reach you with evidence that, that was persuasive to so many other people, yet not to yourself. That's what we have stacked up against your absolute intransigence in a, seeking the appointment of an independent counsel, and now, after the fact, making a ludicrous statement that you're going to defer to the FEC. Sir. completely abrogate your legal responsibility and the ethical obligation that you have to the Department of Justice and to the end of the FBI as the investigators in this case and defer uh, to the FEC, which nobody can maintain with a straight face. You may, you may be the first, but nobody has maintained with a straight face, has the capability, the legal or the investigative expertise, 
to look into and issue the controlling decision on these sorts of complicated matters. Yet you're willing to do that and apparently have been willing to do it. That's our concern. It's not a matter of democracy or counting heads. That's silly and you know it's a silly characterization. That's not what we're talking about here. Sir, after I said counting heads, you began to count heads again, so I don't think it was a silly characterization of what you were saying. But, well, maybe, but maybe, that, maybe that's the number of this whole thing. We're, we're, in, you know, we're in completely different universes here, as I, I said earlier. I don't mean to be argumentative, but... I don't mind. My recommendations, along with the recommendations of some very good people in the FBI, FBI Legal Counsel's Office, up and down the line of justice, and everybody that the Attorney General asked to see, were based on sound legal arguments. And the arguments on the other side were quite valid, they were quite good. They didn't carry the day with the Attorney General who was the decision maker. I think that it was an invalid argument to say that before the FEC had decided this issue, this was a crime that we were gonna put people in, or potentially put people in jail for. I think that that's an abuse of prosecutorial discretion. I don't think any you prosecutor think they, You think the head of the FBI was, was 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 exercising pros uh, improper prosecutorial discretion and recommending that the attorney general simply follow the law and seek the appointment of an independent counsel? The head of the FBI is not ex does not exercise prosecutorial discretion anymore. He's he was, the chief he of was, police. He was, he was recommending, the he was to, recommending to the attorney general that she follow the law based on not just his impression, not just something he read in the paper, but based on the, the testimony, the very solid investigation of large numbers of FBI agents, of the FBI general counsel, Mr. Parkinson, of Mr. Labella, they were recommending that the, that the attorney general seek the appointment of an independent counsel with regard to the campaign violations alleged in the Common Cause complaint and in other complaints, and that is not I'm surprised. I'm, I'm impressed that you can make the make the statement with a straight face that that is prosecute, uh, an improper exercise of prosecutorial discretion. It is not. It is simply following the the law and the evidence as presented by FBI agents and by credible witnesses. In my opinion, the attorney general followed the law and she made the right decision. That was my recommendation to her. She followed it. She understood everybody else. Sure, it's very interesting. Y'all y'all are really very clever, and I give you credit for that also. You and the attorney general. And I think Mr. Parkinson, in, in one of his memos, sort of, sort of laid this out. He didn't use the term clever, I'm using that. Uh, what he said, basically, is that you can take a very complex investigation composed of many parts, and you can technically correctly and technically legally look in a compartmentalized fashion at each separate allegation much like, for example, a traffic officer coming, coming upon the scene of a 50-car sequential pileup, and look at each one of those and see that, aha, there might be a taillight busted here. And you look at that, and then you go to the next car and you say, aha, there might have been faulty brakes here. But none of those in and of themselves rise to the level that prosecution ought to be exercised in a case brought. Yet if you look at the whole picture, clearly it warrants it. You all were very clever. What you do is you compartmentalize these things, you look at each separate one and conclude that, well, it in and of itself does not rise to the level uh, that would warrant uh, the appointment. And even though you may be technically correct and very smug in going back to the American people and saying, we did not technically violate the law in not seeking the appointment of an independent counsel, you have clearly, I believe, by failing deliberately, failing to see the forest for the trees, you have subverted the intent of the Congress and the intent of the American people in having laws that protect them against these sorts of violations, according to the, the, the law at the time when the independent counsel, prior to, to last year when it, uh, when it uh, went out of existence, when it, when it lapsed, was the only way that we provided for these sorts of things to be handled and give the American people the assurance that they would be handled and the criminal pr provisions would apply. You subverted that. Technically, maybe you were correct in being able to do so and pass a lie detector test that you hadn't violated the law in any particular instance, but overall, you thwarted the ability of the American people to have justice done. And yet, when a, when a specious allegation was raised against the head of the FBI that you all had a peeve with, that you all were peeved with, uh, you, you, know, you launch immediately into a preliminary investigation. 
and yet despite voluminous evidence here you fail to do so that is an injustice to the american people and it does subvert the rule of law mr lantos may not care about that but a lot of people do and i don't think you serve the nation well these proceedings are concluded Just ahead, House